Good evening, and welcome to the Thursday, November 1st, 2018 regular meeting of the school committee. I would ask that all who are here to please rise as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a, the agenda before us. I'm not going to go through the agenda tonight as I have done typically, just to try to, I, everybody can read it. They're available online through our district website for people who are at home. Um, and then we can uh, dive right into recognitions if anybody has any recognitions that they'd like to bring forward. But just wanted to remind that we have oh, thank someone. Thank you. So that is correct. We have. Um, Meg Tyler, who is participating remotely and uh, through this computer right here so people can hear her. So thank you for that reminder. I missed the cue on that. <laughs> uh, so if there are no recognitions, uh, then we can go right into public comment. If there are anybody here that would like to make a public comment, uh, seeing nobody coming forward, uh, then we can go directly into our reports. And I would invite the members of the school committee to come on up. And if you could just introduce yourselves again for the people at home, that would be great. I think probably there because there's a microphone there. Uh, I'm William Dion and I'm a junior. Uh, and I'm Alex Bojack, I'm a senior. Um, so we just wanted to go through a few things that are going on at the high school. It's been a busy time um, with Halloween yesterday, the senior Halloween parade, which um, while the Red Sox parade probably um, put a damper on some of the attendance, we still had a lot of people come. Um, and it ended up being a great event with the breakfast and with the parade. Uh, and then moving into sports, the playoff season is right now. In fact, you guys got kicked out because of the volleyball game, but I know that, <laughs> I know that they um, have started their playoffs um, today and um, will hopefully be doing well. Um, some other sports that are in the playoffs, I know, um, unfortunately, the field hockey team, um, I think, lost today um, to Barnes School, but they still are in the, are in the playoffs and had a great season. Um, and I know that boys and girls soccer um, started Sunday um, for their playoffs, um, I believe at 4 o'clock. Um, and the football team plays in Milton for their second playoff game um, uh, tomorrow. And also, I know the, the golf team won their, uh, I guess, back-to-back -back, um, division championship, um, which is fantastic. Um, and then, I guess, moving, in, uh, moving out of sports a little bit, another thing at the high school would, um, is the talent show that the class of 2020 is putting on today. Um, and they'll have a list of musical events and, and magic, I've heard, um, for the talent show today. Um, and then before I hand it off to Will, um, the uh, NEASC um, came in recently to the high school. Where they brought in a few educators to evaluate um, this school. Um, and over the course of two days, they were able to talk with different students to learn about the school and make their own evaluations. Um, we know that that evaluation of Hopkinton High School will eventually go to you guys in a few months once, it's, when the, once the report is put together. A yeah. um, couple more updates. Um, on November 6th is election day, so there, there will be no school. Um, for our district. Um, additionally, on Monday, next Monday is Unite Movie Night. Um, so all the freshmen um, will come. Um, it's sort of a, a fun um, night um, to again, get them involved in the school community. Um, International Night was last Thursday. Um, and I was unable to go, but I heard it was um, very successful. Um, all the students were able to put together a presentation um, on their um, country um, and also bring some food, um, which I heard was a hit. Um, additionally, last week was STEAM week, um, so there were different activities every day at lunch. Um, additionally, we were very um, happy to have the Girls Robotic Day um, at the high school and the middle school um, for STEAM week. Um, finally, Monday the 5th, um, Chris Heron will be coming to the middle school um, to give his um, talk on um, how his story really, um, on how he was able to battle his addiction, and that's open to everyone. Um, again, that's at the middle school auditorium. Um, and finally, uh, winter sports night. So um, we're moving into the winter. Um, so that, um, that night will be on November 14th at 6 p.m. And then um, on November 13th, uh, Mr. Bishop invites um, all new parents to the school um, to a coffee with the principal at 9.30 a.m. on um, November 13th. That's, that's all we got. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thanks for the, making the location change. No, no problem. <laughs>
So that's great. So that will move us into uh, Ms. Rothermick for the late uh, bus transportation. Um, yes, thank you. So I guess there was a request to find out the cost of a late bus for Hopkinton. Um, my understanding is that we have done this twice in the past, um, and both times it was canceled due to low ridership. Um, so this is something that we have embarked on. Um, so the current costs, and the costs are really depending on what we would consider a late bus, you know, in terms of the time that the pickup would be. So if the late bus was three o'clock, so, you know, giving an hour after school, that would be $371 a day. So at 180 days, the cost of that is 66780 and that would be for one bus. If the pickup time was later, it was 4 p.m., then the cost drops to $90 a day. So at 180 days, that's 16,200 for a bus. Now my understanding, because of the large geography of Hawkington, that in the past when we've done this, we've done four buses so that the buses could go to each quadrant. Um, so if you went with a lower cost alternative of, of like a four o'clock, then times four, that 16,000 brings you to 64,800. So that gives you an idea of what the cost would be. Um, I would advise that if this is something that the committee was considering, that you know, maybe we send out surveys, you know, just try to gauge who would, how many students would come, what would be the purpose, you know, whether it's after school quickly or is it after sports, which then pushes that time later, but just things to consider knowing that we have had a history with this and, you know, to make that decision. Is this just for the high school, the late bus? It could be for high school or middle school. Okay. Yeah. So just quickly, if it, it ran at four, it would not be a bus that was recycled from Marathon and Elmwood, correct? It the, would be. Oh, it would be. Okay, so right. they are able to recycle them that quickly. Right. Okay. Right. So you know, it would be a bus that had a short, you know, route. So it may sure. be like four or five. It. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, but that's where you get some of that cost savings. So it would jump right on after an Elmwood Center, Elmwood Marathon run. Would it yeah. be open to Hopkins students? I'm sorry? Would you open to Hopkins students after, like, after school activities? Well, if you open to Hopkins, you'd have to consider whether you're going to have fourth and fifth graders riding with high school. The request was initiated for middle school? Or I'm sorry? Who initiated the request to look into it? What kind of... I don't know. Oh. <laughs> that came from the committee, I understand. Yes, I believe last year we had parents who inquired, and we had said last year that you know, there wasn't, we hadn't budgeted for it for this school year, but we would certainly bring it back in the fall. Okay. So we're bringing it back just as okay. parents and board. Okay. Is there an option for running it more than five, less, less than five days a week? So if we did it three days a week or? Okay. Is that okay? Wait, Just curious. Historically, the last time it ran, it ran two days a week. Okay. And I think because it was run as a pilot, and I correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm sure you you looked into it. I don't have all okay. the history. Okay. I just but it ran, my recollection is it ran two days a week, which was problematic for people who had sports, for example. Every because night. Because it yeah. couldn't get them there right. enough days. But I wonder if a four day a week or something we could consider down the road. I don't right, Having seen just the preliminary numbers on the budget, I know the budget is already very tight, but. Right, and, and just so you know, this is not something that we've put into the budget at this time. Right. Um, it's not something that we've received requests right. in, the, in the transportation department, um, so. Okay. So, and because I'm throwing this out on the fly, if you don't know the answer, that's fine. We can come back to it. But is it possible to charge a fee for late bus only, separate? Well, I guess it, at high school you can charge fees for anybody to ride a bus. High school you can, but you're already charging them for to and from. So technically, if they already have a bus pass. So you can't charge an additional fee for a late. They didn't yeah. take that seat. It, it just. 
it's might, gray. Yeah, it sticky. might be kind of. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, then we can keep this in the back of our mind, I guess, and come back to it as we get further into the budget discussions. Mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead with yours. I'm ready. Every. Ready. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh. oh, oh, I see, yes. I think we're pretty good up there. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so what we are presenting tonight is the preliminary budget overview. And what that means is that we are still in those very incipient stages of the process. Mrs. Rothermick and I have conducted budget meetings with everyone in the district. So everyone from the assistant superintendent to technology, special education, all of the building principals. And what happens is that they come to us with a sort of requested budget. So these, what you're seeing tonight, are everyone's asks. It doesn't mean that the budget is at a particular number. Over the next several weeks, you'll have presentations from all of the principals and, and all of the stakeholders in this process. And at sort of the culmination of that, we'll have a percent increase number, and then we will start to work toward something more final unless you give us other direction tonight. So um, as we put this, this budget together, now, one of the things that was very important to me and I know to the administrators within the district is to really keep the Hopkinton Public Schools um, ranked very high in Massachusetts. Currently, you know that that's where we are. Um, so when we thought about what was important to us, we really want to maintain our educational and extracurricular programming. Uh, we want to be able to offer a curriculum and instruction that meets the needs of every learner. So when we look at some of our students, we have some children who are performing at very high levels. We have some students who we would consider to be at grade level. We have some students that we would consider to be below grade level and struggling, but we need to meet the needs of all of those children. We feel like we are going to, well, we are 100% going to need to add teachers and support staff to accommodate the increases in our student population. I have a, a slide down the road that will show us um, the number of kids that we have this year as of September and the number that we expect to have before we get to the end of this school year. So while we thought when we were starting the school year there were, you know, lots of additional children that we hadn't really accounted for, I think that that's what's going to happen to us as we go through the whole process of the school year. Uh, we need to ensure that our school facilities will support growth for all of our kids. And uh, when I say growth for all of our kids, I use the word growth as opposed to learning because I think that educating the whole child is really important. We need to ensure that what we have um, are programs in the arts, music, athletics, you know, all of those things. Um, to support student safety measures, we have had a continuing plan over the last several years to continue to add lighting and cameras and, and all of those things to ensure, um, you know, to pass entries and those kinds of things to ensure that our kids are safe every day. To continue to build technology programming. And I think when Hopkinton started its programming, we probably did things like worried about one-to-one -one devices, ensuring that you know, every student had that in their hands. And when we did that, we also had the issue of educating our teachers on how to use those devices with kids and how to not only use them with kids, but also how to change their curriculum or their instruction to be able to use technology in ways that made sense, not just in ways that were kind of glitzy. 
I think we're in a place where we're still kind of doing those things, but I think we've made such progress that um, our, our new focus might be on data and getting data into the hands of teachers so that they're making changes to their instruction in real time. And then finally to support our school improvement plans. So before I actually start thinking about the budget, I do like to talk about some of our performance highlights and people might wonder why do we always go to MCAS testing for this. Certainly we have lots of ways that we can show our excellence and I think that in my superintendent's report tonight you'll get to see some of those things that we do on a daily basis that help our kids to grow academically, socially, emotionally, artistically, all of those things. Um, but I like to use the MCAS because it, it kind of is, it levels the playing field a little bit. It sort of shows us where we are relative to other districts in Massachusetts. And when I say that we like to stay at the, at the top of, of that ranking, um, I think that this slide speaks to that a little bit. So on the left-hand side, you can see the grade levels. Here you see grades three to eight, and then you can see our ranking in Massachusetts. And anywhere that we are in the top 5%, the cell is highlighted in green. Anywhere that we are in the top 10%, the cell is highlighted in white. Uh, so there are two places on those cells where we are highlighted in peach, which gets us into the top 20% in the state. Um, and in those kinds of places, like fourth grade math and seventh grade ELA, those are things that now we know we need to sort of work toward. We have to look at the curriculum, we have to look at the instruction, we look at the test takers. But I think that um, those are very nice scores for us to be able to say this is where we rank throughout Massachusetts in which percentile. Because that was a slide that dealt with three to eight, there are obviously more metrics for high school. You get more information, I think, once um, kids are being tested in different ways. Um, so I, I don't know if I should read through all of them, but I will just sort of quickly go through the, uh, in Average reading and math SAT scores, we were ranked 18th. 89% uh, of our students had a passing score, either a three, a four, or a five, on over 1,100 AP tests. And so someone would say, well, why, is there, why are there 11% of our kids scoring ones and twos? And I think if you look at other districts, that, that number of ones and twos or the percentage of ones and twos may be smaller. But one thing I think that Hopkins in High School prides itself on is we allow many, many kids to take AP courses and just try it out. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a very good thing to give kids that, that opportunity to sort of dabble in a college course. Last year in the spring of 18, 100% of the students in grade 10 scored proficient or advanced on the ELA MCAS. Not a single student was in the not meeting expectations or needs improvement category at the high school level. 97% were proficient or advanced in math. Uh, the high school was one of four state, one of four high schools in the state of Massachusetts named um, a school of recognition by the Commissioner of Education. And Boston Magazine puts us in the top 20%, but the top 20% among the best public schools in Massachusetts. So 351 cities and towns aren't there. I think they're only 125. So by all of those standards, we are doing very well. I put these two slides in because I wanted to sort of illustrate that the state has something now called radar data. That's our 2016 radar data. I believe that this may have been the first year that the state gave us radar data. Um, I think that that is correct. And the, the two slides that I'm going to show you there, that one of them is um, by the town's ability to uh, fund the foundation budget. So that one has a financial bend to it. And then the next one. Governor, is it yes. possible to um, zoom in a little bit, please? If I can make that bigger. Thank you. The show. <laughs> we brought our best guy. Thank you. Uh, these types of slides is going to It might not do a work so well. It's not going to probably be okay. what it, you're looking for. I'm actually glad you asked because I think that some of the data on there is a little bit interesting. Yeah, do you think if we go to present it might be I can show you to get a little bit bigger. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think it's for uh, all the viewers and as the narration is going to thank you. The resolution, our resolution. Okay. And so it's different. If we go too big, it's going to throw it off for the viewers on HCAM. 
uh, in essence, because we're set at a certain resolution. So, All right. how about if I just tell you about it? Is that okay? okay. So, on this particular slide, and I'm sorry that you can't see that, the third column over talks about the capacity to fund your foundation budget. And then the next column gives us per pupil expenditures um, in districts that radar says are like us in terms of our ability to fund the foundation budget. So the towns on there are Hopkinton, Burlington, Danvers, Dartmouth, Longmeadow, Melrose, Norwood, Sharon, Wakefield, Westboro, and Neshoba. Those are the ones that are like us. And what it will also tell us uh, are the percentages of economically disadvantaged students, students with disabilities, and students who are L's, or English language learners. And then it gives us our percent percentages of proficient and advanced on MCAS, and it gives the student growth percentile score. And student growth percentile score takes kids who have been in the same cohorts so kids who have the exact same test scores for all of the years that they have been taking MCAS, and then it kind of ranks them every time a new test happens. And I will say that our percentages are very good there for Hopkinton in 2016, district-wide. It was 89% in ELA and 84% in math, proficient or advanced. Science was 78%. But our student growth percentile scores are very nice, and in fact, they are probably the highest in the list at 60 and 65%. Dr. Kavanaugh, these competitive districts, were these um, some things we picked or it was provided by? That's correct. It's provided by the state. So they look at all kinds of metrics and this one is, in particular is our ability to fund the foundation budget. So those are the districts that are most like us in terms of that. When I look at um, you know, the third column, the capacity to fund the foundation budget, mm -hmm. um, if we look at Hopkinton versus Burlington, that seems uh, quite varied, right? I'm sorry, ask that question again. So I'm looking at the at the capacity to fund the foundation budget. I right. just didn't hear your question. Right. So I guess if we look at Burlington, it's at around 96 percent, mm -hmm. um, and we are at 85. Yes, and I think that but the that's lowest considered one in that comparable? list is 80. That okay. that is what. Okay. We're just trying to understand you sure. know, what would be a range that seems comparable. Mm -hmm. So if, if you were to look at this, you know, to, you, to your point, you could take out you know, the highest and the lowest. And the lower two, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, take them out if you wanted to kind of narrow that variance a little bit. That's um, right. But again, these are provided by the state as, mm -hmm. as being the similar but we don't know what they use as their variance allowance, so. Right, and I know this is the second slide, and I don't know if that will, it continues here too, the same comparison, uh, if you look at Wellesley, for instance. Right, so as, so as we go to this one, this is based on demographics. So this is about okay. the students who are sitting in our, our schools every day. And, um, you know, again, you get the capacity to fund your foundation budget, but if we sort of take a look at that, you can see that someone like Needham, for example, has a 140% ability to fund its foundation budget. Um, Wellesley was another one that was very high, 227%. Right. Wayland is 166%, right. right? So that probably is why the variance seems so large in the previous slide. But what, what is nice about this is that you can see that you know, we are, I guess in terms of you know, how many kids are in our school, what's our test performance, those kinds of things. You know, we're kind of holding our own with the districts that um, have a much greater capacity to fund their foundation budget. But that's not exactly why I, I put these on there. I put them on there just so that we could take a look at where we are compared to those districts in terms of per pupil expenditure. So if we went back to the foundation budget, Burlington's per pupil expenditure is $18,364. Melrose is the lowest on the list at 11466 And you can see where we fall in just, you know, Dr. up those 10 communities were like fifth Sorry, just, from the bottom. Just so I can understand, so if if you are deemed to have a high percentage capacity to fund your budget, that means that the district is expected to pay a higher percentage 
Olympus yeah. is rather making answer that so question. With like for, so, for example, if you, were, if you are Burlington and you're based on their assessment, the town is expected to cover 96% of their budget, then I would think their in-district per pupil expenditure would have to be higher because they're not getting as much state funding. Or is that not right? Uh, so basically <laughs> what, it, what it becomes is how much do they expect the community to contribute and yeah. how much do they expect the state to contribute. Yeah. So as your ability to pay increases, the amount coming from the state is going to decrease. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the per pupil expenditure will be higher. The per pupil expenditure column here is what the it's town the combination, is paying? No, it's the combination of okay. both, both funds. Okay, sorry, I thought it said in district. Per pupil spending in district, I thought that meant the for, district was paying. For but. Hopkinton. Okay. Yeah, that's not just the local contribution. It's both. It's everything. State yes. and that yes. helps. Yep. Right, so as you know, and as we look at per pupil expenditure, and in 2016, for example, on this slide, Hopkinton's was $13,785. You know, obviously that's an average, right? Some students would cost you much more, some students would cost you much, much less, much less. Dr. Kavanaugh, why are we looking at 2016 numbers? Don't we have the 2017? I'm going to show you that in okay, just a second. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Sure. Uh, and so this is the, on, by demographic, um, you can sort of see we're landing in, in just about the same place uh, Wellesley's at the top with 17,000 per pupil and Holliston's at the bottom with 11,927. So these are the 2017 per pupil expenditures. This is the most recent data we have. I think that Odessi just updated its website. And so you can, why we chose these particular districts, we chose some of them because they are districts that you know, people will sometimes compare us to. We chose them because they are neighbors of ours. They cho we chose them because they are similar in terms of um, demographics, those kinds of things. Uh, so there's no, I don't want you to think that there's a particular rhyme and reason as to why we chose these. Um, but as you look at things like Millis, Midway, Ashland, Milford, that are Westboro, that are near us, those are why they're on there. Neshoba happened to be one of our, our similar towns before uh, Northboro, Southboro, they're on here because they're, they're nearby. So I just thought that this was uh, also an interesting um, slide in terms of sort of where we land in those 33. And I guess that I would say, it, maybe the, the point of showing you all of this is that when you look at all of our MCAS scores and where our high school is performing and, and the data that we provide, I would argue that we are doing very well by our students given our per pupil expenditure. All right, so these are our FY19 actuals. I don't have for you yet projected FY20s. NESDEC is working on it. I met with um, the planning board at one point and we got um, from Elaine Lazarus a whole list of all of the homes that are going to be built between now and the end of this school year as well as in the next um, school year. So those, those documents are very helpful and I also met with Beth DeLiva who was able to kind of help me understand who's moving into homes and in, in which neighborhoods, which neighborhoods are turning over so that we have a lot better understanding of where people are moving and how many children are in those households. So for example, when we talked about like Legacy Farms South, you know, we talked about the fact that into that particular development, there were not a lot of school-aged children at the time that they moved in, but there were a lot of children that were just about to become school-aged children. So it was kind of an interesting conversation. Um, we took Elaine Lazarus' information, and I know that uh, at one time, Mrs. Rothermick and I had gone through that and given you a guesstimate of somewhere around 132 students that would be moving into the district before June of... Uh, 2019. Based on my conversations with Mrs. DeLiva and some of the conversations I've recently had with um, Don Kennedy from NESDEC, I would guess that it might be higher than 132 kids before the end of this school year. Before the end of this school year? This school year, yeah, June of 2019. 
So here's, here's what we're thinking about student enrollment growth. When we started school in September, we knew we were going to have 50 additional students from the time that school ended to when uh, we, or from the time we did the budget to the time that we thought you know, what it was gonna look like when school started. But as it turned out, we had 139 more than that 50, so 189 altogether. So there were 139 kids that we really had not accounted for. What you can kind of use as, um, as a number is that every time you have 20 new students in the district, you probably need 1.4 teachers. And that happens because at the elementary level, we have art, music, PE, uh, we have special education, we have L services, we have reading specialists, we have math remediation. So all of those, those positions together come to about 1.4 per, per child. At the high school level, one kid has seven classes, so he has seven teachers. So that would get us to the 1.4. And if you look at our DESE data, I think that they tell us that we are about 13 point something um, per kid. So by that, it's probably a little higher than the 1.4, but I think 1.4 is probably a, a good number to use. So when we left the budget last year, we, and I've, so I've taken the 139 and rounded it up to 140. So if we think about those 140 kids, every 20 of those means that, you know, we have seven groups of 20. And so if I have seven groups of 20 times the 1.4 FTEs, Realistically, that's about 9.8 FTEs that we needed actually in this school year that we didn't start school with. And as we go through the school year, we can anticipate that there should be more and more kids as houses um, become habitable in the many developments that we have in town where builders and homeowners are, um, are finishing construction and moving in. All right, so this is the data that we had um, from Elaine Lazarus. And what we did was we, we yellowed out the um, age-restricted property. And oh, now I'm not so sure that we, we should have entirely yellowed it out. But if we, if we took a look at that, you can see that if everybody had one child, we'd be at 132 kids. And that's by June of 2019. If people had two children, obviously we'd be at 264 kids. Um, and that doesn't mean that in every single one of those houses a school-aged child is moving in. But what we tried to do was sort of have some kind of an average. Dr. Kavner, would you mind going back to that sheet for a little moment? Um, could you speak a little bit about NASDAQ's, um, you know, extended projection work that they're doing? Do you have any insight into that? So, I do. So I met with Don Kennedy, and I know that he is working with Connor now, because another a hard to predict area is kindergarten, obviously. So they're going to look back through the years and see how many kindergarten age kids appeared on the census, for example. So we know that not everybody fills out the census, so we can't be certain of how, how many kindergarten age children are actually living in Hopkinton. But if we looked back several years and we thought, hmm, pretty typically it's about 80% of the kids who are actually starting kindergarten appear on the census. If we can get that census number, and you know, let's imagine that the number is 80, then we would know we'd have 100 kids. If, there were, if the number was 160, we'd know we had 200 kids coming into our kindergarten. Now, we could be very much surprised, just as we were this year. We imagined that we were going to have 204 kids, and we had 260-something kids. Uh, so, but what we're hoping is, in that kind of census work was not done in the past, but that's the kind of work that NESDEC has agreed that they will do for us this year. Uh, so, you know, we, kind of look at these numbers. I shared these numbers with him. He also said that he would be contacting realtors to kind of gauge how many bedrooms are in particular homes. We also looked at places where, so there are some neighborhoods where you know, a first time home buyer might move in and maybe that person has a, you know, a four year old and a two year old, right? Uh, or a first time 
you know, maybe it's like the second time you're buying a home, but like you're buying that home because it's your forever home in Hopkinton, right? But then we're also looking at neighborhoods where people are moving in with, say, a sixth grader and a second grader and trying to gauge that. It will probably be difficult to determine exactly how many kids are going to be in each one of those grades, but I think that in, in big gross numbers, we're probably doing a pretty good job. Sometimes that's okay, because if you think about, you know, say the Elmwood School, for example, we can shuffle second graders, teachers up to third grade, third grade teachers down to second grade, so you can move elementary folks around. It's not ideal, but you can do that. And at the high school level, you, know, you can always create additional sections of biology, for example, and then, you know, reduce the number of, you know, college prep algebra if you have to do that. But that happens all the time in high school levels. I think that our big concern would be if the numbers got huge, not which grade level they landed in. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm eager to hear from NESTEC when they come here with their report and some of the details behind this, because you can't simply, you know, you, how do you think about it? One child, two child, or, you know, two children or three kids. It's hard to predict. Yes. Right. So what are the analytics that they use? And likewise to what you talked about, you know, if you have empty nesters moving out, how do you assess for that? Because what this is showing is simply new home projections. Right. And so I think with the neighborhoods that are turning over, I think Mrs. Deliva has been super helpful with that. That's great. So I think we are reaching out to as many resources as we think we have available to us. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. And I guess when we looked at this slide right here about enrollments, I was just reluctant to put something into that projected FY20 until I have better data. Better All right. You're okay. on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as you can see on this slide, again, um, as Dr. Kavanaugh stated, we've met with everyone. Um, all the departments, they've brought together all their asks from, from their buildings. Um, so at this point in time where we have landed is an increase of 9.9%. Um, we have not had further discussions in terms of what if scenarios yet. It's a lot just to get all the departments together and listen. So we were just really on the listening end uh, to put this together for you tonight. Can I just ask um, what instructions were given to the administrators who produced their budgets? What was it to continue at our current level of services? Was it to invest in any particular areas that we think are strategic, like certain technology education or curriculum changes? Or you know, what sort of instructions were they operating off of when they came up with numbers? Well, what they always look to are their strategic plans, are their school improvement plans within, within their building. Um, they were given pretty much make sure that you do as best you can to level service your expenses, um, but we did not tell them to level their staffing. They have to address the, the students that are before them. Okay. And in terms of like the MCAS, um, like the peach boxes, that looked like opportunities for um, maybe changing our tactics or approach to, mm -hmm. to getting those peach boxes up. Um, like, are we striving to get everybody to advance? Or, I mean, what, what is, where are we looking there in terms of investing? So I can give you an example of that. Uh, one of the things that Vanessa Bellello has put into the Hopkins budget is a math coach. And, at this point, I think she's probably thinking about a 0.5 math coach, not a 1.0 FTE. Um, but if a teacher's salary is somewhere around, you know, and, and if you're hiring a math coach, you have to hire somebody who has probably a lot of years of service and an extensive skill set. So imagining that that salary could be anywhere between 90 and 100 thousand dollars, you know, we're talking 45 to 50 thousand dollars. And in that building, in in particular, you know, we've always looked at their scores, and ELA is up this year, up markedly this year. And we, I think, we did that by looking at data, and having BAS, STAR data, QRI testing, and you know, implementing guided reading and SRSD and and different programs. So over time now, teachers have gotten very good at that, and we are starting to see those scores go up to places where we're really excited about where they are. Uh, the same hasn't happened in math, and we are now using a new math program. So we are, you know, when she put that into her budget, while it might appear to be something that is 
gratuitous or you know, superfluous because that person may not be in direct contact with children all day, one of the things that we think is that it will be really helpful to our teachers to have somebody coaching, um, modeling some kinds of instruction, actually pushing into the classroom. And so that's one of the ways that, that we deal with those kinds of numbers when we see them. I ask just a, a quick question. Would, is, can this presentation be made available? I just I see our selectmen and appropriations liaisons writing furiously back there to make it available on the under the budget tab of on the website just for in for people at home who want to see. Sure, it as well. sure. Yes. And this next slide, basically, it's just a reminder um, that really eighty percent of any budget is is your payroll. It is your staffing. Um, so when you have an influx of 100 or 200 students, the biggest impact you're going to see is in the payroll, in the payroll line. And you can see that if you go back a few years, it's probably about that same 80-20. So, and again, just a reminder of the FTEs that we have already had to add this year. Um, 4.6 uh, secondary teachers, the two L teachers, uh, campus aid, four general education um, instructional assistants. And really you see those because we did not add a teacher at the, at the marathon level. So had we added a teacher and redistributed the kids, you may not have seen those, um, but we chose to put in the in additional supports within the existing classrooms. Um, so that's why you see the difference between the, you know, the general education TA and then the uh, special education um, instructional assistants. And that, again, is the 139 students that we didn't plan for. So the personnel asks that are in the FY20 requests for, that you saw on that first slide, Elementary teachers, 2.1 at the Marathon, 0.4 at Hopkins. And each one of these, we'll get into the detail when um, each of the buildings make their presentations. So you'll, you'll get more into that. Um, secondary teachers, 2 at the middle school, 2.5 at the high school. Adjustment counselor, 1 at the Marathon and a half at Elmwood. A math coach, which is being looked at really for Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins. Uh, maintenance, this is adding two additional maintenance positions to try to get one per building. A webmaster and a technician for the technology part. A librarian, 0.5 basically for each of the elementaries and a 0.4 at the high school. Guidance for the high school. A benefits coordinator at central office, 0.5 nurse at the high school, an additional learning specialist at the high school, four special education paras, uh, two general education paraprofessionals, and then support staff, and this goes across uh, marathon, special education, high school, and athletics, and teacher of the visually impaired at 0.3. So these are the increases that you see in that 9.9% um, uh, slide that you saw earlier for personnel. Go to the next slide. Is there any other question. slide? Is this? Oh, there we go. So I just paused because I didn't know if there would be a question. <laughs> Do you have a feel for how many of the personnel increases we would need even if we don't add another student? Like how much of it is growth driven and how much of it is new program driven or unaddressed need that we currently have because we under budgeted or something? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So if we look back at the guidance counselor at the high school, for example, uh, that's one of those positions that we have added beca because of our current enrollment. You know, typically what happens is a guidance counselor has a particular caseload, you know, maybe around 200 kids or, or whatever it is. But once that 
starts to creep up too high, then the guidance counselor can no longer give good service to those particular children, right? And we know that guidance counselors will help with social emotional things, they help with college planning, they help with course selection, so there really is an awful lot that they're doing with their 200 students over time. Um, and, and I don't actually have the exact number that our high school guidance people have right now, um, but I could certainly get that. But the guidance position and the nurse at the high school are a very good example of when we say 1.4, that's what happens when you start to increase your student population. If the nurse can't service you know, 1,100 and something children, then we need to bring in um, another half-time nurse at the high school. Did I answer your question? Well, so when we fill in the projected column of projected enrollments, when we get all that from NESDAQ, and will there be additional asks? Is, is, there, is, is there a level of assumption of growth in these numbers, or is this just to meet project, the current services? Or I would say that this is just to meet our current services, honestly. Uh, and, th and that doesn't mean that if you hired a, a half of nurse, there wouldn't be wiggle room, certainly right. there would be, yeah. right? Um, but for example, if we took a look at you know elementary teachers and Marathon is 2.1 and Hopkins is 0.4, in the event that 22nd graders arrive in the district, that, that's gonna go up by one FTE. So right. there's no really built-in growth assumption yet in Correct. these numbers? yes. Okay. So are these areas where we are feeling deficient right now in the schools based on that what Amanda just said? Well you know that we put in a point two math teacher and a point two science teacher you know just recently right. like that when we're thinking about advanced math classes where someone is teaching five classes with 30 and 31 kids in each one of those classrooms I would see that as a deficiency, right? And we won't bring that person in until January, so those numbers should go down a little bit in January. But in the event that our, our um, student population continues to increase from now till June of 2019, who knows how that will hold, you know what I mean? So is it safe to say that many of these requests are based on trying to make up some of the 139 kids that we had this year that we didn't necessarily plan for. Some of and it we're is having some growing pains, and so we need these teachers and staff to, to alleviate some of that. Some of it is compensation for this year. Some of it is prediction for next year. Some of it is really about bolstering scores in places where we saw that they were low. Um, some of it is because we have a new math program, and we want to make sure that you know K to five, our teachers are feeling really comfortable and solid teaching teaching that math. But, you know, uh, Mina asked me the question about what NESDEC is saying. Uh, when I met with Don Kennedy, he said, there is no other community in New England growing as quickly as Hopkinton right now. So when we get the school presentations, will, they, will, there be a, <coughs> will we be able to hear what is kind of to introduce a new program or in what is growth? Will you be able to hear the drivers behind the numbers? When the you will, okay. yes. And I think you know, as we worked in our budget meetings with the teachers or the principals, we had conversations about like, where are your asks? If something was coming in sort of level funded and level serviced, we kind of just left that alone. Um, but when somebody wanted something like a halftime math coach, you know, we talked a lot about the need for that. And so this slide basically you see really taking those same numbers but summarizing it. Um, you know, by department, by building, if you will. Just a, a different way of looking at it. Okay. So then when you get into the expenses, so as I said, you know, a majority of what is driven is um, through payroll. Uh, but of course there is still a 1.4 million um, increase in expenses so going through these quickly central office the big piece of that is transportation um, not only do we have the contractual increase but this budget is also adding two additional buses again to accommodate that is to accommodate growth um, we have many buses at the middle school high school level that are at capacity 
we cannot add another student on there and knowing what our projections are um, we put in two additional buses for that in addition we also increase the budget for homeless transportation and that's really just adjusting it to what we are experiencing as being our actual so that's our big increase for um, central office it's really all driven by transportation uh, curriculum is being driven by uh, textbooks we're looking at sixth to eighth grade math eighth grade civics and ap art and ap u.s history in there Athletics, there's a 40,000 uh, increase in contracted services, which is really transportation and officials for three new teams um, and software. And there's an increase of 37,000 for equipment, which are for new nets, setups for um, volleyball, um, mats, and an, an additional utility cart uh, currently we have one utility cart which is used by the athletic trainer. Uh, this would be another utility cart to get the AD around to the various fields. Um, so that's where athletics. Regular education really for the most part is a very small increase and some of the things that you do see in there is actually set up for additional classrooms. Um, as you're seeing, um, as we're adding teachers, you need to add tables and chairs and, and things like that for those additional classrooms. Building and grounds, the big piece to that is really utilities um, for Marathon. This year we were able to take advantage of a one-time rebate and we're also bumping uh, up the utilities for Marathon just to really reflect some of our buildings that have a similar square footage. The difficulty with Marathon is we still really don't have any true experience um, to, to budget on. All last year as they were building, they were either commissioning equipment, meaning they're running it at full tilt, or they didn't have anything on. So all of last year really is, is no data. So we're still running with no data. So this one's a little difficult, a um, little challenging to uh, budget for. Um, the other piece to that is our extraordinary maintenance. You remember last year we cut a lot out of our extraordinary maintenance in order to make the budget. Um, so this is putting the, some of that money back in for repairs that are needed in each building, um, such as uh, you know sidewalk concrete repair, water testing, bubblers, etc. Occupational day, that's tuition to our uh, vocational, and that really just reflects um, student growth in enrollment. And special education, again, this looks higher of an increase because as a reminder, we took prepaid transportation that was in that budget for FY19 and we transferred that to salaries. So our salary increase is less because we've already moved budget there but our um, expense is, is greater. So it's a wash, but when you look at um, salary to expense difference, it, it starts to fall out in, in here. Um, so as a reminder, that was uh, 319,000 that went to um, salaries. There's an increase of 434,000 in um, out of district tuitions. And this is a result of move-ins that uh, we also got. So as we're getting students, we, we also can get students that we have to meet them where they're at. And if they move in with a, um, an out-of-district placement, then that's the, the stay put, if you will. Um, so those costs will become ours in FY20. We've also proactively put in the budget for two unanticipated move-ins. Um, so while we had three move in and in, in this year, we've put in the budget for two next year and hopefully try to uh, stem that tide a little bit. Um, so those were the, the increases for special education. I have some thoughts if I may share. Um, so as you were giving the narrative on the MCAS scores and how we compare, with all the districts, um, I think obviously we come very strongly um, with those results. I'm wondering how we are doing with regard to SEL 
and any statistics around that because that's another area, the social emotional mm -hmm. learning, which we have heavily invested in, rightly so. So is there um, any way you could possibly bring that narrative into this? I guess it would be, I mean, maybe we could look at some of the kids who get SEL services that are you know, part of a particular program, not something that every student gets. And we could look to see, you know, how those kids are faring on tests. But, you know, it, it can be a little bit difficult. I mean, we could look at, you know, course grades, rate of passing, that kind of thing. Are we losing kids too? So, it, and maybe this came up when we were looking at some of that data when um, Mrs. Parson made her presentation on MCAS, and we said, okay, so we have these two sides. If we looked at the special education side, we had no dropouts, but if we looked at the general education side, we did have one dropout in that particular year. I think that in this past year, we have had no one leave school. But I think those are the kinds of metrics we might be able to look at, but there are so many variables, it might be hard difficult to bring hard and fast data around that. And sometimes our kids who need social, social emotional support um, are kids who fare very well on standardized tests and sometimes they are kids who don't fare as well on standardized tests. Maybe one thing we could look at is um, the number of students who use those programs. Yeah, um, you know, I think you have the statistics, you're closer to those. I recall last year some of the results with regard to the Metro West survey that was presented. I yes. think things of that nature perhaps, you know, when we are presenting this, I'm interested in seeing the growth of the whole child, sure. not just in terms of, you know, math and English. Right? right. The other thing that comes to mind is athletics. Mm -hmm. You know, I would like to see that story highlighted in here because we do so well in that area. So just in that narrative, if some of those could be highlighted, um, I think that'll help to exhibit how we are helping the whole child. Right, and we can even look at the number of kids who are part of our athletics program. I mean, percentage-wise, I think if you compare us to other districts, it's very high. We have very high participation in athletics. And likewise, if there are any other extracurriculars, you know, whether it be clubs or what have you, if there is any way to uh, bring that narrative in, mm -hmm. I think that will give a complete picture. Sure. Um, the other question I had was, you know, I think Amanda spoke to this a little bit about the peaches, right? Mm, um, yeah. The peach colored gaps. Besides math and ELA, what are the other gaps that we have? Are there you know, could there be a slide on some of the areas that we need to work on? If you can think of that. Um. So, and, and this will certainly come out as we start doing the strategic planning. Um, uh, you know, part of my entry plan was to collect all that data and I have tons of it now. Um, but, you know, looking at things like how do, do boys fare compared to girls? Where are we struggling at the elementary level in reading? Where are we struggling at the elementary levels in math? Uh, you know, every, things like that as well as, you know, how many kids are suspended, how many kids are chronically absent, how many, so there are loads and loads and loads of, you know, pieces of data in that information that I think will be very helpful, um, not only to this committee, I think, but to the community as we start to look at the strategic plan. Right, I guess that just sets the perspective that, you know, here's the whole child that we have worked on and here are the areas we still have work to do, yes. right? So when we are going back to the community, presenting this, I think that narrative will be helpful. Yes, agreed. Um, I have one question with regard to, um, you know, the, um, the teachers and the staff that we have, if you wouldn't mind going to that slide. This one? So, yes, um, you know how we have um, the expenses lined out, uh, you know, by uh, whether it be special education or whatever other areas, is there any way to show the breakdown of the three million odd that we are asking with regard to the staffing requirements so that we can also see how do all of these add up to that three million? So is that I'm just, I'm only pausing to make sure that I understand the question. So as you're looking at that and you're thinking, say a guidance counselor, for example, and we would guess that 65,000 might be a reasonable price tag to put on that. That's right. And I would think that in that 3 million, there might also be some salary increases in there. 
Is that right? Yes, that's, that's correct. Right, yes. so you would have that bucket that this is the salary increase, but here are the items because that will also help when the time comes, you know, obviously I don't think we will go with the 9.9% .9 increase. So that will help us also as we go through that, you know, where is it that we could possibly look for opportunities to be more efficient. Yes, and I think too, even with the teacher salaries, um, in addition to you know, the percentage increase that teachers have there, we have to remember that many of them have step raises and some of them are making lane changes. So for example, they're going from having a bachelor's degree to a master's degree, a master's degree to master's plus 30. Right. So right. all of that is factored in. Um, one thing I want to say is that I, I and I think all of us do really appreciate all that our teachers do. Um, you know, it's, it's huge. What I would also like to see are some statistics around salaries. I don't know if those are available, teacher salaries, as compared to some of those other districts that we are saying are comparable mm -hmm. to us. So I think that is another thing that I'm interested in seeing. Um, besides that, I was wondering, as we look to hire these teachers and staff members, <coughs> how transferable are these skills? You know, do we hire someone who's a, you know, learning specialist, say in the high school, but also has Spanish or, you know, whatever um, other background that may be there that they could be transferred if needed? How much do we focus on things of that nature? Well, if you could find, it, in an ideal world, it would, it would be wonderful if you could find people who had a content area certification as well as special education certification, but it's sort of difficult to find those, those folks. I mean, everyone's, I mean, the lovely part about that is that you could have someone, if they're special education certified, meeting the needs of the special ed kids in that classroom um, at the same time that that person is teaching in a content area. So, for example, if you looked at, like, sophomore math, if you had somebody who could you know, address special education needs and also you know, teach geometry, that would be amazing. Okay. Um, I guess the last question I have on my mind is with regard to the process. And I know I see our um, Board of Selectmen Chair and the Appropriations Committee member, and I'm just wondering how that process is going and how is the work with the town manager going? Have these preliminary numbers been shared? What are their thoughts? 9.9% is pretty high. Pretty That's high. not where we talked about, you know, last when we met. So how is that process going? So uh, the budget advisory group is actually meeting on Monday. Uh, in, I don't know if you have had conversations outside of that group, but just for context, last year we came in, I think, at about 9% for the preliminary, and it, our job going forward here is to listen to each department and to make some choices. I would highly doubt that we would bring it, anything close to this to the, send it to the selectmen at this point. It, it, it will go down as part of the process. Okay. We, because we do have a fiduciary responsibility to the town, obviously, and um, I think the taxpayers probably would not be very fond of us with a 9.9 percent .9 increase. Yeah, I, I'm just you know interested in making sure that there are transparent conversations happening, right? Obviously, there's so much growth, right? So that also needs to be heard. At the same time, you know that's not the numbers we started off with. So instead of getting into the same place as last year, where we started with that big number and then had to work through it, and it was a very long process, and we made a commitment that we are going to try and steer away from that. So that's where my question is coming from. Um, yeah, but obviously this is, this is a lot of work. Um, thank you to you and everybody on your team for bringing this forth. Yes, they have worked very hard on this. So thank you. Okay. One more thing that, that I am not, I, I, we're not there yet, but in terms of looking at costs and are we assuming all the fees would stay the same when we look at athletic like fees bus fees bus fees in particular it, it, at this time we hadn't entertained that discussion so I, I just would be curious it and I know this is probably counterintuitive to trying to bring a budget down but I know there are a lot of concerns with the traffic on Hayden Row if and we have a number of years ago the school before 
before my time had committed to bringing the bus fees down a little bit to encourage more families to be able to take the bus and to look to see if we, there's any way we could accommodate some of that in this year to hopefully alleviate some of the traffic on Hayden Road. It might not be possible. It might not be the will of the committee in the end, but I would be curious down the line to look at if, how that would impact our budget if we could encourage more ridership on the buses, just for the town's interest as well. Sure. I have one last thing. We're good. Um, I, and one of the things I mentioned when I emailed you about this earlier this week was were the you know the drivers behind the budget, mm -hmm. and I think you definitely answered that, that question in this presentation. But um, you know, as going forward, I think those things maybe need to be called out, emphasized even a little bit more. The the things that are sort of fixed, mm -hmm. like um, teacher salaries, for example. I mean, even rough math, if you're hiring 28 new staff and you're just using 50k as a plus minus, that's over one and a half million dollars, 1.4 million dollars, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So, I mean, that's, you know, right there, that's just new hires, 1.4 million dollars. That doesn't include the 2% increase, that you know, cost of living increase that the, the teachers get. And so, for sure, payroll mm -hmm. is a driver, at least in, in my opinion. Um, but also, to what you brought up, Susan, about the um, special education, our inability to, to address those costs by prepaying tra transportation this year because of the tight budget from last year. So now we have this pushing a million dollar special education budget, which doesn't include any new children who join us next year with special education needs. So I feel like those two things are kind of fixed. Mm -hmm. We can't, we have no wiggle room with special ed and teacher contract. So if we could call those out a bit and then you know, that little piece that we have left <laughs> to play with to try to get into that ballpark area that we agreed to, to work in um, when we met a couple weeks ago. I think maybe that would be helpful because that's the ballpark area that we can, we can play with and the other things that are fixed, we really don't have, our hands are kind of tied, right? Yes. Okay. And just to get back, I needed to, uh, I don't have my phone, which I use as my calculator. <laughs> um, but as, uh, just to, for busing, we currently bus 84% of the students, so which is a pretty high uh, yes. percentage. So playing around with the bus fee may not actually get you to the traffic your impact. intended um, purpose. That's um, good. Just so I, I actually I, had asked that number mm -hmm. today. I am, thank you, I appreciate that. Did not expect that you'd be able to pull that that quickly. There you go. And sometimes we do talk to parents who have purchased bus passes for their children and still have you know a student driver or a parent driver you know the bus pass is just that thing to fall back on yeah that also happens i just have one last quick thing um you know i echo what mina was saying about looking at um, a little bit broader definition of best and success not just mcas mm -hmm. and i think we exchanged email about that but um it, um, I'm wondering about the growth numbers. Just quickly looking back at the slides, we were looking at um, 140 students that we've added this year, um, and the math came out to like 9.8 FTEs. But when we actually look at the other slide that shows how many we added to accommodate that growth, it's a lot higher than 9.8. Are you looking at the TA numbers? I'm looking at the personnel increases added in FY19. Yes, so if we go back to the TA numbers, yeah. and it looks like it's a lot hi higher. So those general education pairs at 4.0, yeah. even though we would call them four FTEs, you know, given that salary, it's probably the equivalent of one teacher salary, if that makes sense. But we still it, needed to add them. But, but keep in mind, we added four FTEs at the kindergarten level yeah. instead of adding one kindergarten teacher. If, it, if we had done it in advance, it would have been one kindergarten teacher. Okay. So this, is, this looks higher because we did the four instead of the one. Right. So, but, but we what, would, so wait, 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 I think we would have added one kindergarten teacher, but we also added assistance to the other teachers who, it wasn't just accommodating that new classroom, I thought that we were sharing then pairs across. Yes, what we were going to do is have 12 kindergarten classrooms yeah. and have six paraprofessionals who would be 
shared across two classrooms. Yeah. And no, I mean, I think originally we thought we were going to have 11 kindergarten classrooms. So when we got to 13 kindergarten classes and the numbers were up around 2021, we originally thought that they would be somewhere around 17 when we had that, that sharing thing. So when we got to 13 classrooms, we said, all right, what do we do? Do we add a 14th teacher or do we add in pairs to help with the 21 kids? And we went with those four pairs. So I guess I'm curious about where we have capacity, where we've invested this year, because now we have theoretically pairs we can share even further, if necessary, maybe? I don't know. Like, I'm wondering where, what would change the dynamic? If we added 132 unbudgeted students next year, mm -hmm. we don't think that our ask would be, I mean, we're, we're thinking it would be around 9.8 and not wherever we ended up. Right. So I'm wondering, where's the capacity? We, we must have built some capacity with what we added this year. Well, and what we had said to Mrs. DeBow as she came forward with her budget um, is that you know we're going to go back to looking at that sharing one pair across two classrooms. Okay. So, you know, if you have to go to 14 kindergarten classrooms, we'll go to 14 kindergarten classrooms, but there would be a reduction, sort of, in the number of pairs. Okay. Right. And I didn't know that it was para driven. I just saw the 9.8 was an estimate for the, based on our growth and our reality was much higher. So right. I didn't know that it was a para. 9.8 refers to teachers. Yeah. This refers to both teachers and paras. Okay. So. Thank you. Although sometimes we do say FTEs and we lump well, everybody personnel. together. Yeah, I don't yes. know. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to, the lingo changes. Yes, that's the problem there, I think. When you see TA, if it said para, it would be easier too. I think so. Yeah, yes. so we apologize for that. So, well, we certainly have our work oh, cut out ahead of us. I, I didn't know if um, either of you wanted any questions to ask or you want to hold off till we get into the actual budget discussions, uh, presentations, but department to department. You can come on up if you want. So I think the only is just, and I think this tradition is done when you are showing, you usually shall show what the class size is, um, that, you know, so you'll show, um, so we can make sure that it's within the ranges. Um, and just what the budget schedules are going to be having meetings, just during the regular meetings, and you review it, or that information will be helpful. The, the schedule of which departments are appearing at which meetings? Uh, yes. Yes. Exactly. yes. Yeah. That we can. Oh, I can have Georgia yeah. send that. Yes. Great. That would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to ask you on your special aid costs. Um, has, has what we will get from the state for special ed through circuit breaker been factored into that? Are those numbers above and beyond, or is that is that before you um, allow for you know include the income that will be coming through state assistance? That that's already using the offset for circuit breaker. So that's above and beyond. That's know? correct. After that's after. That's, that's correct. Okay, that's the bad yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. another one sorry <laughs> all right so I did um, create my superintendent's report uh, using a, a, a Google slide presentation there are some small videos embedded in here I hope that they're going to play maybe maybe not we'll see uh, so this is sort of my what's happening in the Hopkinton public schools uh, the sixth grade just came back from a trip to nature's classroom uh, apparently fun was had by all and a little bit of learning took place too I think so I have uh, whoops is this gonna work I think if you put it in the slide let's mode. see there we go there we go hi it's Mr. Kelly coming to you from roommate here in the classroom as you can see we got uh, some students here a swimmer and a swimmer and a
Our student council friends talked a little bit about um, STEAM week. So in these photos right here, you can see our first graders. Uh, they are, and the exciting part of this, I think, is that they're engaging in the science practices. So when we got the new frameworks for science, it wasn't just content-based anymore. It was getting kids to think and behave and act like scientists. So that's what you see here. Our first graders now have microscopes that were given to them by the high school. Wow. I know, it's really exciting. Uh, these are our kindergarten kids. They um, have erupting pumpkins. You can see we have some uh, fall and Halloween uh, themes here. And then, so in, they did these by, by day, I think, so that you'd have an S day for science, a T day for technology. And so you see them on the right-hand side doing some math manipulatives. They've got batty math manipulatives. Um, this is really exciting. The, this is kindergarten as well. And you can see them on their uh, touch iPads. They are coding. But at the same time they are coding, they are you know, sort of writing stories. So they have to create a setting and they have to um, sort of build their characters. But mathematically, they are also using numbers where they have to talk about one more. And they are also building two digit numbers if they really want that, that octopus to move. Uh, the goal was to get your octopus from the bottom of the ocean floor onto a boat to tell his story. <laughs> Uh, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to see this because what they did, the second and third grade teachers have a really strong STEAM focus at, at Elmwood. And what they did was they did their, their STEAM days of the week. And so I just have a really quick video here. I hope you're going to be able to see this. Let's hope it works. <laughs> Here you, on the right hand side, you can see the Hopkins kids. Uh, they were building bridges and creating animals. You can see my girl over there on the right. She's got a lot of paraphernalia <laughs> with her to create those animals. Oops. All right, here we are at the high school. Um, our student council friends talked a little bit about uh, every day at lunch. So you can see some of the activities over on the left hand side. You can see Fab Lab. And um, on the right hand side, you can see a biotech activity. I will just show you a very quick uh, engineering video, courtesy of Doug Scott. Ooh. Oh. 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 Oh
that will just play and play? I think it's worth a second view. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, they were also telling us a little bit about uh, girls and robotics. So this is uh, one group from Girl Powered. And then we had a very first uh, unified basketball game. Um, our team played against was Vocational Technical High School last Wednesday. You can see some great pictures of our athletes. And this, I just feel like I have to show you because it was one of the most amazing parts of unified basketball and it actually came as a bonus. So uh, this is Ben Leibowitz. And I'm actually gonna play the whole thing because it's great. He was very surprised when I came to find him. I was like, are you Ben? He said, yes, I am. I think he was shocked when I, I asked him. Uh, so the other night we had a, uh, the casual con concert, and I call this another bonus performance because uh, Craig Hay had said to the audience that night that uh, they, they polled the seniors graduating and said, what is it that you know, could be helpful to, to future musicians? And one of the things the kids said was, uh, we have a, an early concert, and then we don't have another one until sort of December. And it would be really nice if we could have another performance somewhere along the way. And so that's what the casual concert is. And I'm just going to show you a smidge of that. I think I am. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. That's a, a, a really nice offering to be able to bring that in midway through the semester before we get to the winter concert because in nice because the kids don't have to put on their their formal music uniform and all that. Yes. And if we had forever, I could show you because you know they had the jazz band perform and the symphonic band perform, and we took videos of them all. <laughs> but it was Hats it was a really Mr. nice Hay. night. For uh, bringing that. We also have just a little bit of visual here from the Halloween at the high school and Harvest Fun at um, Marathon. So uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that we have five different kinds of Barbies, and those girls would get in those Barbie boxes. 
It was amazing. So there's World Series Barbie and Ballerina Barbie, and it, it, out of the boxes they came. It was phenomenal. Uh, and on the right-hand side, what you see are TSA uh, agents. They actually set up a great big silver booth at the front door of the high school on Halloween morning, and everybody got wanded and had to stand in the booth on their way into school in the morning. So two wildly clever among several wildly clever outfits. Um, if you ever want to be entertained, Halloween morning at Hopkinton High School is where you want to be. Is that, uh, is that Mrs. Debo? The dice? Why I believe that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. Not only is she a domino, but she's also a math manipulator. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we like. Uh, and you can see that she is celebrating with Cubby, who is also a Red Sox fan, apparently, celebrating um, the World Series <laughs> parade. And on the, on the other side there, you can see... Um, help me with Paul's name. Yeah, Mark Bovier. Uh, he was your Grand Marshal. Grand Marshal. Our Harvest Parade. This is his final year of teaching. Yes, that's great. Really so where was the parade this year? Because in previous years, I know it's they've gone around the common. So we have enough sidewalk at the school, so that we could <laughs> march around the sidewalk of the school. And by the time the first class was entering, the last class was exiting. We have so many children. <laughs> and just curious, were the pre did the preschoolers do their own thing, or were they part of that as well? So they did their own thing. It's a little overwhelming. I, was, I, I don't think they would have the stamina to march around the school <laughs> so much. So they did something else that was just wonderful, and they uh, had their harvest uh, fall celebrations on Tuesday. Nice. All right, so the next part of this is the culture and diversity work update. I've sort of broken it out by school. Um, at Marathon, they have the Bright program going on. They do some classroom community development. What does it mean in every classroom to be part of a community? Uh, their back to school night was a bring your family to school night. So really sort of a, that celebration of, you know, the kid brought, kids, children brought in their families to kind of lead them around the school. And um, it was nice, I guess, to see the kids. I'll let and you we talk to it. We even had um, shuttle buses from the high school. so. That was, I think, the greatest takeaway from any families. We had grandparents, we had younger siblings riding the bus to school, and that was just a, a boatload of fun for the kids and for the families. Um, so that was wonderful, and it was so nice to see extended family members come to school, and they were amazed at how adept the children learned the building and could navigate where to go, and they were so excited to show them the music room, the art room, the gymnasium, the hospital, you know, the, the health office, um, <laughs> Dr. Burns, as many oh. referred to her. Yes, it, it was a great, wonderful night. Actually, wonderful nights, because each grade has their own night. We just didn't bust the preschoolers. That was, that was a different night. <laughs> uh, Elmwood also has a bright program that we're implementing this year. You know that... Uh, We've, many of us have met members of the Elmwood Diversity Council, and um, not unlike Marathon, Elmwood also does faculty meeting discussions. So that kind of work has been woven into faculty meetings. At Hopkins, they have uh, something called CARES, and that involves cooperation, assertion, responsibility, empathy, and self-control. And they also have understanding our differences. Those should be on two different lines, so I apologize. Uh, at the middle school, they are doing the power of we. They've brought in the Anti-Defamation League. They have safe schools. They also do faculty meeting training. And there are a couple of teachers there who are doing mindfulness. Uh, just as a quick aside, those two teachers who, do, who are bringing the mindfulness uh, programming to the middle school, they are also going to be running a program for parents in the community. So any parents who want to practice mindfulness, you can sign up for that free of charge. And um, it will give you a very good sense of what mindfulness looks like for the kids in school. And then at the high school, um, I believe that Mr. Bishop has expanded his school council. And what he was trying to do is to have his school council better match the uh, demographics of the student population at school. Uh, he also has the Anti-Defamation League working there. And they are working very closely with his Unite group. He does faculty meeting training. And one of the things that he has asked of his faculty, too, is that all of the teachers um, have 
for their teacher evaluation this year, the culturally proficient communication element from standard three of the teacher evaluation rubric. Um, and then he also has a group doing mindfulness. In terms of the admin council, so the entire leadership team, our next meeting with Khalees Wernham is on November 13th. Uh, when we get together for our admin council meetings, we try to have some kind of monthly dialogue. We either bring in chapters from everyday anti-racism um, or culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Those are the two texts that we've been sort of using. And right now, tentatively, I am looking at December 5th at 6 p.m. for a date to do um, a little bit more of the bring in the community and listen to community voices. Uh, just so you also know, um, in grades 5, 8, and 10, uh, Desi is, does a, um, a survey with the kids, and uh, we have just recently gotten our vocal survey report back, and vocal stands for view of culture and learning. And so though that information is also very interesting, what our kids have actually said about their uh, experiences in the Hopkinton Public Schools. And today, a group of seven of our educators also attended a DESI conference entitled Leading with Ac Access and Equity. So DESI is providing little snippets and bits and pieces along the way as well for us. Oh, when, when DESI does that, I, I should be clear, when I say grades 5, 8, and 10, they implement those surveys um, with the MCAS. So it just is like sort of that seamless Everybody's sitting in a room anyway taking a test, so here's one more sort of bubble sheet to fill in. Is that data available on like the DESI? Is it in, like in the aggregate questions or any of that vocal data? Is that available? So it's not publicly available. We have to pull it out of the Dropbox. Okay. So. Is that something you're looking to share with the community? Uh, I think that I would look to Mr. Bishop, Mr. Uh, Keller and Mrs. Bellello uh, before I, I committed to that because it's really a reflection of what is happening in grades 5, 8, and 10. Uh, but I don't necessarily know that. Um, it, so they'll give you sort of the, the range of where you would want your, your data to be. And in sort of all places, our data is it's in a good place. So. All right, and the last part is that girls and boys cross country, golf and volleyball were all Tri-Valley League champions. Every single team went to postseason play, and the Hiller golf team for the second year in a row are the state champions. And that's all I have, which is enough, I'm sure. Dr. Karen, I just have a quick question on, uh, you know, if you don't mind, as you broke down by, by the schools, the oh, work yes, that's yes. going on. Right there. Um, you know, it, it looks like some of these have been in place for a while, while some are new. Mm -hmm. If there is any way to kind of mark those out, to kind of show the effort that's being made by the district, where especially in your goals you have called this out, the work that you have called out, I think that might help. Right, so I would say that at Marathon, for example, um, probably all of those are new this year. Um, so the right year in um, work, to develop a program to our goal is to have it in place for next year so that building that capacity that addresses that aspect of you know we're working well with academic social emotional it's more the social emotional mental support of students so that work is ongoing this year um, the faculty meeting discussions as we have done more at admin council it's more of a targeted focus at faculty meetings than we've ever had before so it's not that we haven't done it not to this level right. Right. Um, okay. and i think it's a reflection of what's going on in our, our school Ch population is changing the world is changing and it's just the right time to start to do those things there which in turn carries over to what occurs that incidental natural classroom aspect embedding that throughout your day so that it's not a separate aspect of teaching and learning so this becomes sort of our approach all over um, so that I'd say that focus and angle of that is different than it has been in the past if that makes sense sure no I understand okay. like you're <laughs> going into the depths of it the intent, and I sure guess, is, fair is, enough it is purposeful and intent um, full more so than it's ever been in the past 
Um, I'm also um, you know, glad to see the all teacher standard three of culturally proficient communication. I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on promoting that th through all the schools. Yeah, I mean, you know, Evan and you know, his uh, two administrators, you know, when they're dealing with the teachers, you know, that was just something that they sort of came up with and I think it is kind of brilliant. Um, I guess that's something we could talk about at admin council. I mean, I wouldn't want for, you know, all of the principals to tell all of their teachers that that was something that they needed to do if something else was more important. Do you know what I mean? And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't still evaluate teachers on those things. So what happens with the 33 elements is that you know teachers will choose a particular number. So you'll usually be evaluated on four things that are related to your two goals and then eight other elements. So I mean, if there was a teacher who needed work in you know, curriculum or lesson planning, I, I don't think that I would want to say that that particular person should get as wrapped up in culturally proficient communication as, you know, teaching and learning. But certainly it's not something that we would overlook. I mean, the work is very important, but yes. Yeah, I, I would really like to hear back after your conversations um, on this particular topic, sure. uh, what everyone's thoughts were. Yes. Um, and with regard to the community engagement, could you share your thoughts a little bit on, on that front? It looks like you're looking to have an open forum in December. Beyond that, are there other opportunities to engage the community? Well, at this point, I, I would say that that's probably, you know, sort of step one in terms of engaging the community. But there were people who, when we did the survey, said that they would be very much interested. So we'll reach out to them, but we'll reach out to the entire community. In this, just to highlight, this is different from the forum that we that you did on the survey itself back in was that October or September? It was yes. A few weeks ago, but yeah. I mean, this is a nice way October, for us to perhaps. almost have that sort of listening tour to hear, you know, sort of what the community thinks in terms of, you know, taking the pulse of what's going on on the outside of our schools and what's going on in the insides of our schools. Are, are Bright and CARES, are those curricula that we have defined or are they, are they programs that we've um, adopted that are sort of out? I don't know what they Bright, are. Yeah, Bright is something that we are working with a group that we are paying, but I'll let you talk about so, Bright because you're in the middle of it. The upper levels has the START program, yeah. so you might be familiar with that. The Bright program is the Brookline Resilience and Youth, you know, it might be up there. I, I'm oh, trying yeah, to Bridge for Resilience Bridge. So this is, has recently come to some elementary schools with great success so that we are able to provide that therapeutic short term, which for elementary might be 12 weeks support so that we can support those students within district, that is the goal, and to have that sense of all encompassing support, the parent communication, the clinical aspect, the wraparound services, the academics while um, that is occurring. So when we've worked on diversity, it's not only cultural diversity, we have children with vast experiences that have had trauma in their lives, socioeconomic diversity, like we are trying to address all of those needs and that program, a version for the elementary schools would help us do that within our schools. It's helpful to relate it to START. I've never heard so of it. Yeah, so if you're okay. familiar with START, it's, it looks a little different because we're little different kids. The age group there, but um, it it's, it's it. more like an elementary version of that. That's a good way to sum it up. <laughs> and they're a wonderful group to work with. Um, you know, Mrs. Parsons been with us at meetings. We've started meeting over the summer um, to plan, engage. We have a workshop next week that some of us are going to for their they pull together networks too to build resources with other schools and other programs so that you're sharing what's working and building upon that, um, which is a great help when you're trying to begin a program at a new level. I have one uh, other question, Dr. Kavanaugh. You know, this, is a, this can be a fairly sensitive topic. So when you are looking to partners like Bright or, or any of these that you have listed, what is the process like? How do you choose a particular group, and if you can speak to that a little bit? Sure. So some, sometimes they, they will come to us from people who are um, part of the admin team. So for example, with Bright, Dr. Zaleski had, you know, as part of being a special education director, 
had learned about this in other districts. And because it was also related to the START program at the high school and we realized it was getting to the elementary level, she was the person who had reached out to them and you know, was able to do this with grant funding. Uh, for example, someone like uh, Khalees Warnham, I had gone to a workshop and uh, there were three different kinds of diversity there that day. And you know, one of them, for example, was an LGBTQ presenter. And so you know, I had gone to Khalees' workshop and found her there and found her to be you know, pretty compelling. So that's kind of how uh, we came across her. But the ADL you know, came to us through a grant, and again, that was because we had assistant principals in the high school who had um, been working with a group in Jobalike, and the Jobalike people had said that they had ADL in their buildings, and it had made you know, sort of a really nice difference. So um, then they applied for the grant, and that's how we got the ADL. Is a, que no, a yeah, question please. specific to the ADL grant. Is that, gonna, is that work continuing next year, or was it a one-year? I believe the grant was a single year, so I don't know if the ADL, you know, has sort of year two and we would have to pay for it out of pocket, or um, if this is just something where we get training for an entire year and then we're done with ADL. That would be something that, like you know. Like train the trainer, kind of. Josh Hanna and Ann ben Benick are the, are the two assistant principals who are responsible for that. It would be interesting, I don't know if there's a way to collect data directly from because I, I know students have been trained with mm. this as well to get some feedback from them as to how helpful it's been and to see if we can assess any of the impact that they yes. specifically had. And really what happens in public education, you get a lot of that kind of qualitative data. And if people would be interested in hearing what the kids thought, you know, in that kind of qualitative sense and not by, you know, these are the kinds of like metrics that will be vetted, um, we could certainly do that sort of thing. That would be great. I, I think it, that helps get at the heart of some of what's what the issues that we're aware of that have sure. been happening is to see how effective the kids are feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that something that vocal would capture? The that we could, you know, conduct some kind of like exit survey data when they finish with the ADL. Okay, we could do that. So I guess, if, if I can I tag on to sure. your report, I, I, this was something I know having you report back was something that had been requested at our last meeting to hear a little bit about what the district is doing. So I appreciate you bringing that back in. I know there are other conversations that we want to have, um, not tonight, but I know one of the other suggestions that you had had that I really liked was uh, looking at having some training for some of us. So I would like to look at perhaps some options that people might be aware of, maybe reach out to some other groups that are going through trainings um, yeah. locally and see if we can collaborate and maybe join in with what they're doing or if there's something better available. Anybody else have anything specific to that? Yeah, we probably, um, you know, maybe look to do some research and, you know, based on what Dr. Kavanaugh has shared, perhaps bring this back at the next school committee meeting as an agenda item and take it forward. I think we have some work uh, remaining from the last meeting that we did. So I think that's another topic to be brought up. Indeed. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gatner. Thank you. But, um, that was a very thorough report tonight. <laughs> I know. Thank I know. You. But so many things were happening and I was getting so much marvelous information from teachers and administrators that I thought I should really share this. Yeah, I, I spoke with two kids um, who went to nature's classroom and they just loved it. And the video of the airplane, I can't get over it. I want to try that. <laughs> I see it in action. Dr. Okay. just notice on the agenda, there was a list of you uh, after diversity talking about strategic planning. Is that oh, yes. an update? Were you going to update oh, that? Oh, yeah. I, well, the very brief update that I was going to give to you is something that I probably already said. Uh, so I, I have the data, and yeah, and it will be time for me to start, you know, looking for people in the district. I know that uh, Mr. Bishop and Mr. Kella have offered to sort of assist in that whole process. So it will be time to reach out to the community and think about what that strategic planning will look like, hopefully with a sort of first of the year start. So the data is from your um, listening tour? Well, most of the data in there are things that uh, 
So we do star math and star reading, and so I think we have two or three years of data for most of the kids in, in Hopkinton right now. So for example, when we talked about the, the two peaches, like the seventh grade ELA scores, you can see that if the greens are where we want kids to be, there's a much bigger slice of blue and yellow and red for that particular class, right? So the star data is there. Um, SAT data is there, college acceptance data is there, uh, BAS data, MCAS data, the um, frequency with which kids are absent, the frequency with which different subgroups are you know, reprimanded, suspended, disciplined, whatever. So a lot of that stuff is in there. Um, the listening tour data, I have conducted the entire listening tour. I haven't actually put it in the binder yet, but I'll call it close to that. Are we on the listening tour? The school oh, committee? I think, I, I think originally in your goals we were listed yeah. as, a, as a listening to our stop, and I'm not sure that we've had opportunity to yeah. discuss strategy hmm. with you yet. So maybe we need to do that. Georgette was reaching out to everybody on the list. Maybe, I don't know if she overlooked no, you. No, do you think, do, or, we, do we have a slot? Do you think we should have a slot in the listening tour? I think so. We could definitely, you mean, just to be clear, you mean like as a group or individually, like a collective, we could add it in on. To have an opportunity agenda. for school committee to share strategic thoughts or visions or whatever as part, I'm assuming that's what the listening tour The listening tour asks sort of five questions. You know, what do you see as our strengths? What do you see as our weaknesses? So they're very global questions, but I would be happy to sit with this group and listen to the answers. So, and then another just question in terms of looking at where the next steps is the, the point at which we as a committee put together the committee to do the um, strategic plan mm -hmm. is that when you're talking about early January or are you talking about the having the committee put together before then and then launching the into the work in early January I would but, hope to launch in early January okay. yes. so we should put that yes in our agenda beforehand and then we can discuss back here uh, I have to look it up, but I think there were probably one or two representatives from the school committee who were on the committee, strategic plan committee, the committee for the committee. Right. So that brings us into the uh, school committee chair report, and I will start out by saying that I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrant 19-034. 19-035, 19-036, 19-037, 19-038, and 19-039. And all warrants have been included in your packet. And I have also approved for payment the payroll warrants S19009. And then beyond that, I just wanted to um, circle back to a request that came up um, actually from Meg, who I also want to clarify, she is no longer with us live because the audio was not good. It sounded like we were underwater, so she's um, watching from us remotely. But uh, so a request, and I, we touched on a little bit of this last time to discuss the roles and responsibilities of the school committee. And I know that we had sort of touched on this tangentially in our meeting last time. And what I would propose to do, and not every some people may agree, some may not, but that's, I I'm, would like it to discuss it, just if we want to do this or not, is to have the MASC, and just for people who are at home, the MASC is the Mass Association of School Committees, and they are our, our, they are our people that support the work that we do. And to have them come in and to lead a discussion with us to help us clarify, um, I, I think it's good in part because we've had a few months under our new committee as it is and with the new administrative team. I would be a fan of it also because they have far more um, experience and knowledge on some of these things. I know not everybody is, a, is in favor of that perhaps, so I would like to hear from others on your thoughts on that. So is Meg uh, favoring this, is that what you're saying? So I, Meg had requested the, as an agenda item to discuss the roles and responsibilities of the school committee. And this was one way that I saw to fill this request as an agenda to expand it and to facilitate our conversation to help us maybe have some more difficult conversations in productive ways in terms of how we move forward. I think as a group, we are all 
motivated by really great ideas in moving forward, but I think sometimes we could use a little help channeling our energy uh, in coming together. Sure. Wouldn't you? Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, I was wondering, wouldn't we want to add that as an agenda item and probably discuss as part of that? No? So, in term, well, it would be the agenda item, would be that. And how we meet the agenda item would be to have the MASC come in to have the discussion. It would be part of it. And I did reach out to MASC to see if they were available. It is, they come for free because they're, we're a member district so that we can take from it what we will or not. And we've lost nothing other than the time that we've invested. Right. I, I guess I'm not quite clear in my mind um, what is it that MSC would come and do? We all take MSC training, and I know um, some of you are also going for the upcoming session. Um, so I'm just not quite clear what is it that is being sought and what is it that MSC would help with? So this is part of their district governance program. Okay. It's separate from the MASC training that we've all taken. Okay. And it, they, there are three separate kind of modules that they can do. This is simply looking at the first piece of it, which is really around the roles and responsibilities and helping us define the direction we're going in. And I think that also could potentially lead us into another agenda item that we had discussed bringing, that Amanda had brought forward over the summer, which is looking at what our goals as a committee are. Not just what the goals in terms of the education that we, we all share with our district administration and staff, but the goals of, of where our priorities are as a committee. I see. Um, uh, again, I, I guess in my mind, I'm thinking maybe we bring this forward as an agenda item and perhaps share our thoughts. And as part of that, if it emerges that some training will help, absolutely. That's how I would look at it, but sure. Well, I like having um, the MASC come because I feel like they can frame the discussion around what are the actual roles and responsibilities of any school committee member in right. any district. Here's what you need to do. This is what your job is. And I think that would be really helpful in establishing sort of some concrete, here's your responsibilities, here's what falls under your purview, here's what doesn't fall under your purview. And I think it would be nice to just make sure we're clear on, on what, what it is that we have to do. And then if we have interests, ideas, things that we can bring forward, they may not fall under school committee business, they may still be equally or more important, but they may fall into more community business as opposed to school committee business. And I think that's a good, a good clarification, actually. I like the idea of having a third party. I think it's yeah. very difficult for a, a team to discuss team dynamics without a third party kind of helping with that. It's nice to have an objective, neutral uh, yeah. process manager to kind of walk us through it. Yeah, so I, I like the idea. Okay. So we could maybe hammer out um, more specifics and kind of circle back and you, you like yeah, sure. conversation um, about that. So I appreciate it. The other thing, um, I, if this is the direction that we go, would be, would people be able to or willing to have an earlier start time, not because the total meeting would last longer, but because it just for convenience factor, I, I, to start with, if we, we started with the MASC portion, if they came to start, say, at 6 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock, because I know as the evening wears on last time, I, my sense is that people do not want to go very late, and that we could put off things that are not time sensitive, perhaps put off policy and things that are not pressing so that we don't have a larger agenda total. But uh, would that be something? not just for this specific meeting, but perhaps something to consider um, meeting earlier, starting our meetings earlier in general. Would be. You don't have to make a binding decision right now. I just was tossing that out there as a decision, as an idea. I'm open with regular meetings. I mean, I talked to Dr. Cabano, uh, you know, last time when we met, there was this whole conversation <laughs> that we should have a cutoff time that we can't just keep going because we're all too tired by then. So the other alternative could be if we started at 6.30. I'm absolutely fine with it. That's just speaking for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 yes. I feel like it could be, I mean, our public, um, you know, attendance is not such a, such a 
huge concern because, you know, we have a pretty light attendance, but I feel like if we start too early, trust me, I'm all for getting out before 1030, but, but I feel like, you know, it can be difficult for people who work to get here by 630. Yeah. Um, it can be difficult who have to do the, the trade off with young children, mm -hmm. young spouses to get here by 6.30, doable for sure, doable. but just something to keep in mind. Yeah. That's yeah. a good point, um, Jen. Do and I don't know about HCAM too, uh, how do they slot us? We could certainly have a conversation with HCAM, yeah. but the, the other thing is we do have two public comment periods that That's people true. do have the option of coming later, and we could also look at playing around with when they are, if, unless people just don't, if people would prefer to meet at seven, that's fine with me as well, but okay. as an option going forward. So. We can try it, see what happens. All right, so that um, brings us into liaison reports. Anybody have any liaison reports that they would like to uh, share? Sure, I, I, have, I have it somewhere. Um, so we had the community communications meeting. Uh, Dr. Cabinot was unable to join, and I haven't had a chance to connect back with you. It was a fantastic meeting, actually. Alexis Miller hosted it, and uh, you know she represents HEF, and uh, she had reached out to many other community groups. And what we came back with is uh, possibly hosting a community organizations fair in, in February of next year, uh, which will be hosted by Jim Cousins from HCAM, um, and where you will have all community, different community organizations, whoever want to join, come in, talk a little bit about their organization, and we all get to hear one another, know of one another's existence, purpose, um, and just share ideas and views. And my interest primarily is for us as a school committee and also Dr. Cavanaugh to stay connected with the community and hear and have those connections and have, you know, keep listening and sharing ideas. So that was a great meeting and I'm hoping that uh, we will post it ahead of time and perhaps the entire school committee could join in February. That would be something uh, to look forward to. The other one um, is the Marathon Fund Committee. Actually, this is something um, I do want to circle back with Dr. Kavanaugh too. That was a good meeting. We had someone from the running club um, who had come and had requested some funding from the Marathon Fund Committee. And uh, she had talked about the fact that they uh, give out $2,500 worth of scholarships, two scholarships. And uh, we had gone over the process that goes on and it's primarily an essay that kids get to write. And it's open to all the kids in town. And they primarily go to our guidance counselor. So one question that came up as part of the process is, how do you reach out to the entire community, right? Because there might be some kids who may not be in the high school, you know, whether they are out of district or what have you. So they said, we usually work through the guidance counselor. Um, so that's another question that are they able to reach out? So maybe something to look at separately. The last one is the website, um, the school committee menu. Meg and I had a good conversation and kind of updated beyond just the main page. And what we were hoping is with the pictures that Ashok had taken quite a while back, we want to add little bios of all of us. So if you could all think of, you know, um, about 100 words, at most 50 to 100 words to kind of share a little bit about yourselves to be posted so that the community knows who is it on the, uh, that is representing them on the school committee. And likewise, we need write-ups on each of the subcommittees that you serve on, what's the purpose of it, um, or if you're a, a liaison, what is it that you're looking to do. So if you could, you know, let us know if two weeks is a reasonable timeline for you, or if you need more, that'd be great. So that'll help us. We want to come back with kind of present the entire menu um, to the school committee for approval. Mina. I'm just wondering if there's anything that we can, even if we don't have all the content, can we already take a stab at replacing yes, our landing page with yeah. what you already have? Because sure. 
I think you've got a lot already, right? And we can, we have the hooks to hang the rest of it once we write it. I mean, we can do two weeks. That's a good deadline, right? No, I but, I love that thought because Amanda, I've been struggling with this. That it looks like we keep coming back, asking for you know those minute changes versus if we posted it and kind of changed it a little bit, that might work. Um, so I I would love that, and I was hoping to possibly catch up with Georgia next week. Yeah to kind of get trained on how she does the edits. I personally think what you and Meg had brought before was phenomenal, much, so much better than our landing page of a meeting grid, which isn't really very welcoming. So I would be in favor of you taking what you have. You know, we can iterate if we, and it's not asking, I think Georgette can probably put it up very quickly or train you or, you know, however you want to do it. She's very adept at it. so. That would be nice. You've done helpful. the work. I'd like to reap the reward because you've done so much already. Yeah, that that would be a huge help. And if you found something like if you just simply don't agree with, you know, we can work it and reword it or take it out for the time being and figure out where to go. Because otherwise, we seem to have been in a limbo for a while. We go for it. Yeah, sounds good. Great. Thank you. That's awesome. That's all I have. Well, we have, we have a policy subcommittee, not subcommittee, working group has that, <laughs> and um, we've been working on it, through, going through the, um, the list that was identified as in terms of, I think we're on um, threes and fours mm -hmm. pretty much right now. So um, we have, I think, one today, and then we have a couple coming um, over the course of the next several meetings, trying to be mindful of budget and how long those discussions are going to take. But that for the first time maybe ever, is my only liaison report. My kids have been like, this has been amazing two weeks. Amazing <laughs> one. So, dinner every night, amazing. <laughs> I just have a quick one, I know it's getting late, but we had, um, on a night with a, I think it was a tornado threat and hail, and I think there might have been a game, I'm not sure, we had a public forum on the website. So right. <laughs> against all odds, we um, did have people come in to, um, work with us on um, our district website and um, Ashok and his team did an excellent job of putting together a series of activities um, and we observed people trying to accomplish tasks on the website and it's amazing what you can learn as you watch people struggle through things that seem obvious to you but when someone else is trying to do it um, you clearly see how it's not obvious to all. So we are in the process of synthesizing what we learned and putting that together with the other things we know to come up with our requirements and so forth. So we're moving along. Our next meeting is November 9th um, at 7, I think, a.m. at the high school. So come join us if you like. <laughs> I have one from Meg, um, which is that the from the Youth Commission. She said the number of families reaching out to Denise Hildreth and the Hopkinton Youth and Family Services has doubled. Uh, there's also an impressive increase in the number of youth reaching out with anxiety issues. Uh, the Youth Commission is preparing for another Martin Luther King Jr. Day event, building upon the success of last year. Tamoria Seba, excuse me, Tamoria Seba put on a day-long event in 2018, which will be hard to match. Concerns uh, from the Youth Commission is depression in girls is increasing and families who are struggling socioeconomically are really struggling. So those um, for us to keep in mind. I also have here from, um, from my own stuff that I was doing, the Athletic Field Subcommittee met and uh, working on getting grant money, a lot of grants have been applied for uh, and also working on a grand opening, even though we had sort of the soft opening where we went to the field hockey game uh, in the spring, there's going to be a larger opening. Also looking at um, allowing people who are potential sponsors to bring them out and invite them to see the, perhaps to see a game in action, to see where something could be with their name on it, to see why they would be motivated to want to support this. And again, the goal here is to meet our commitment to the town, uh, that we, the commitment that was made when this was passed at town meeting. So that's why we're continuing to raise money for it, even though it already is built. Then um, the budget advisory group is meeting on Monday for our first official meeting, which will include the appropriations and the board of selectmen, the town manager, the finance director, superintendent, and myself. And um, I will report back on that. Um, that's why I don't have any update on that specifically. And CPAC bingo uh, was a very fun night. Families that were there, um, 
seemed to really enjoy it. It was a good turnout, and they raised about $1,000 that they'll use towards scholarships and bringing in speakers uh, on different topics that are relevant to them. So that was, that was it for me. So that moves us into the final international travel approval. OK. So I'm really just looking for your um, approval for these Three trips, one of which will take place over February vacation and the other two during April vacation. Um, I know that the committee had given preliminary um, support for this. So, I will look at these. Uh, the first one is uh, for the trip to China. Um, Xu Mueller is the um, Mandarin teacher at the high school who is running this trip. Uh, she has given you the names of all of her chaperones and you have the agenda there. Uh, they'll be leaving um, on the 12th of April and returning on the 21st of April in 2019. Okay. Any questions? Do we have to vote them separately or do we um, vote them all at once? Oh, I suppose we could do them all at the same time, right? Sure. Um, yeah. The second one, is Erica Weiderlow's trip to Paris, France. She will be leaving on April 13th and returning on April 20th. Um, there are only two chaperones on that trip. And then the last one is the trip to um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica trip is in February, running from the leaving on the 16th and returning on the 23rd. Um, and again, we've got uh, two chaperones for that trip. Questions? I move to approve the final international travel for Hopkinton High School. Second. 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 Go ahead. Okay. Motion by Jen, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. And so those are final approvals, so we will not hear back until we hear how wonderful the trips are. That's correct. That brings us into um, Mrs. Dubo. I apologize. I should have brought you out of order. <laughs> But you've been very informative to you, <laughs> you have. Well, I'm happy to be here. And actually, it's perfect because what I am meeting with you tonight is to share a proposal to adjust, adjust the dates of kindergarten screening. And something that will provide us is a greater sense of who is coming. So I think it segues, follows nicely into Dr. Kavanaugh's um, report. So currently, we hold kindergarten screening the last three days of school in June. This is um, a time where families bring their children in. It's a requirement to Massachusetts that kindergarten complete kindergarten screening. It is a quick process. Uh, we plan for hour blocks. It typically takes approximately half an hour. It's not an IQ test. It's not a placement test. The purpose is to assess developmental learning areas globally to determine if there is a need for specialized education or further evaluation. So it helps the school plan to ensure those students' needs are met. So currently holding it in June uh, proposes some challenges for us. We didn't have all of the students attend this June. Um, many families still vacation in June where their children are not in school. They're not on the school year calendar. So if we are able to shift kindergarten screening earlier in the spring to March or April, I feel that we would have a greater sense of who is coming. We would be able to begin the process introducing families to the school earlier. We've already gotten inquiries, when do I register for kindergarten? So we've already had a handful in it that was in October. It's November, I'll have more tomorrow. So, so this, it, it, transitioning to kindergarten is a huge year for families. So spacing out our transition activities, I feel would be nice for families, which in turn would impact children. Instead of right now, they're sort of, they're clustered in May and June. So able to spread that out, provide that information so families have a positive sense of who they're handing their children over to. Now, on the staff side of this, our kindergarten staff would be able to participate fully in the screening process. Right now, they currently administer screening, but now they would able, be able to follow through with the process, screen, go through the re results, go through the debriefing, what are the recommendations. So typically, they're able to screen, and then they're not a part of that process. I'll do that, and then when they come back in the fall, they're caught up on some of that. And I think that is a disconnect, that they should be part of the full circle if you will, for that. So if we were to adjust these screening dates earlier, 
what that means is these are no school days for kindergarten because it is our staff that conducts the assessments. You need the space and you need the staff to be able to do this. So those are my, I think I hit on all my points, but it, um, key points for us, it would help us plan for the year ahead, I think with greater, well, I can't guarantee it because you never know this town, I mean, but it, it, it should give us a greater sense of who is coming. Now, what do you do with the new families? Just as they come, you screen as they come? So they're screened when they're here. In September, right. So um, it's our staff. So where we had the meet and greet day in um, August, the first day for grades one through 12, that was a meet and greet day. Meet your kindergarten teacher, and if you weren't screened, schedule a time that day. And we tried to get as many as we can. But at that point, children are placed in classrooms. If there is an identified need, you're looking at what is the best way to address that. Make sure you've got the processes in place to help if there is testing that's required, whether it's a refer whether it's a um, rescreen in a few weeks so we try to get as many as we can that first day but still you can't catch them all if you will so then you're doing it while you're also teaching but where we screened in June this past year we were close to the NASDAQ prediction and we met, we had over 60 children that we didn't plan on so if families knew earlier before they take those vacations because that was an aspect we had out of country travel we have that's the week we rent our house um, because it is the last three days of school so based on our snow days it pushes further into the summer and if you don't yet have a child on the school cycle you're not attentive to that school calendar if you will so ideally we would catch more parents um, in march or april Mrs. Debo, um, is the screening primarily for special needs or does this also include any EL services? So in the past we've paired it with L screening. So um, L screening is a separate screening that our L instructors and coordinator conduct. So there are some time requirements on the L screening. And also a bit of caution that our L um, director shared with us, some children who are screened and qualify, if you will, for L services, growth and development, then if they do another check, don't qualify in September because they're, they're five, they're four. Um, so if we're able to coordinate it for L uh, educators to conduct their screening at this time, we would, or that still may need to be a separate time. I don't know how beneficial it is because of the age. Mm -hmm. Some Our screening is for children that are around five years of age. You, you have a, a few months window, if you will. You could have someone that's four years, six months, up to five, you know, two months, whatever the screening range might be. The L screening is not really supposed to be for the kindergartners prior to like the preschool age level if you will so there and I don't have the months on their screening so what I don't know if that's helpful for you or if I'm explaining <laughs> it properly they might not based on the window of age for this child they're supposed to screen they might not be able to do it earlier because part of the guidelines of their assessment a child might have to be four years five months or they might have to be um, four years, three months, and if someone was just turning five, you know, I don't even know if I did my math right there, but we would have to look to see if they could coordinate it at the same time. I, see. I don't know, I guess is the good answer. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, you get to speak with CPAC a little bit to kind of get their thoughts on shifting this forward, because you know it better than any of us how children change you know in, in that age group every month right right there is a change so by shifting it in you know would that skew anything um, what are the thoughts of the CPAC parents so this is for all children and if children already have an IEP they they do not need to participate in screening because their needs have already been identified sure. so this target audience you know and it's this Massachusetts state law is that children are screened to determine there's no educational need that is overlooked so the broad areas are language development motor development and concept basic um, concept development so the kindergarten screening 
is set in months, if you will, so that even moving it up, we're within the guidelines of the screening tool that we use. Okay. So it, it, the way the screening is reported, if you are four years, five months, it's a different set of requirements than if you're already five. So it does take into account the age for that, knowing that they're developing different skills. Something that's difficult for just about all children, even if they are five, is skipping, for example. Most of them can hop and gallop, and skipping is one that when children have a hard time with that, and that helps to understand the motor development, the processes, we're not as concerned about. But if some children um, have difficulty responding and repeating areas where it comes out that you want to check them again, and perhaps we'd like the speech pathologist to, this would give us a better sense of that to, to plan for such needs. Could I also just add that I believe if there's a child that there were concerns for, there is a rescreening that mm -hmm. they would do in the fall. So if we feel like the, the development has happened over time, yep. then we can do it again, or we, we would. We'd yep. be obligated to do it again in the fall anyway and see if there was growth. And we have that happen now even in June. You know, children will score in its three broad categories. Okay, they, they fell where they needed to be, refer. They should have a deeper evaluation or rescreen. You want to check again. Sometimes we have children who realize we're not their parents and they don't want to talk to us anymore. <laughs> or they just, um, they have a cold and they're congested and that might have impacted their ability to follow um, directions. So my intent to adjust the screening to would be to be get a better sense of how many children are coming to us, what might some of those needs be, and also to spread out that transition to kindergarten where predominantly it's May and June, starting that earlier in the spring to give that information to parents. Kindergarten parents are a unique group. There's a lot of apprehension. And even at center, when they thought, gosh, that school looks so big, it's more so. So if they can have some experience in and see it's a warm, welcoming place that will take good care of their child, it would be um, wonderful. I have one last question. Are there other districts that you've looked at who have dates this early? In my previous district, we screened in March. I see. Um, when I first came to Hawkington, screening was done at the start of the school year in September. I think the population was different. I think you had, that was at the time of full day uh, tuition based and half day kindergarten. So I, I think that in terms of how it worked then, it worked. As we've grown and changed and planning on the, the number of classrooms we need, uh, um, it makes sense where we moved it in June now to move it up. And there are districts that do do it earlier. I, I think in your district prior, it might have been um, April. Or, yeah, we, yeah. yeah, and just to kind of yeah. add to what you're saying and maybe to kind of um, relieve some of your apprehension, there is no right answer to this question about when is the right time to run the kindergarten screening. I think it really does depend on the individual district and what we feel works best for our students. And I will say that when we moved ours earlier in the spring in my last district, it was monumentally helpful to the staff and to the families. By the time those students began kindergarten, we felt like we already knew a lot of them and their families, and that really was an incredible help. Um, we had a lot more information for our planning, for our placement process. It's not a placement test, right. but it, there's a lot of information that helps. And, and, it, it, and on top of all of that, it really helps the kids. That is very helpful, Ms. Barson, with my, where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stabar. Anyone else? That's good. We have a motion then that we want to entertain, or is there? Sure. Motion to approve the request as presented by Mrs. Stabar. Okay. Motion by Amina, a second? Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. And so, so most, thank you very much. For okay, thank you. We greatly appreciate this. <laughs> this will be a great help. Thank you for bringing it forward. Yeah. It's, it's no, I look forward to coming back and reporting how many we were able to have attend. That helps guide our planning process for the next year. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. And that brings us into School Committee Policy JLB Financial Assistance for a First Reading. So we're bringing you JLB to you tonight um, simply because when we found it, it contained inaccuracies. So for example, under fee reductions or waivers applied to those set by the school committee as well as those charged by schools, fees set by school committee include but may not be limited to in the middle of the page. The difficulty was that it said full day kindergarten there and um, 
we no longer pay for full day kindergarten because everyone gets full day kindergarten. And the other one was the one-to-one -one laptop user program. So those were the two inaccuracies that we found, but as a school, uh, policy subcommittee, we did talk about uh, this this morning. So those were our, our two big ones, and we also you know, let you talk about the athletic wear other than school-issued uniforms. Do you want to speak about that? Go. Okay. So um, one of the things we, we noticed is this final bullet on the list of fees, um, because athletic wear or other, other than school-issued uniforms are not fees set by the school, and it's on the list under fees set by the school. So um, we talked quite a bit about this because we were trying to sort of figure out where it was coming from. And so our suggestion is um, that there are instances where clubs, activities, teams have um, not equipment, but things that the kids wear in order to identify themselves as members of the team that aren't necessarily provided by the school. The kids are kind of, you know, the families need to purchase these things. And so it's not a fee so much as it is something that, an expense that could be put on the families. So we wanted to um, change that final line to just say, um, help me, I gotta remember now, well, I think, school wear? I think it, it was specifically those items that are required to participate. So yes. for example, if you're a cheerleader, your issue, your skirt, or your, you know, your whatever, and your sweater, but you don't really get the hair bow and the, I mean, cheerleaders the have to look uniform. So there's sort of accessories that have to be, in order to compete, you really have to have those things. For some people, those items add up. For um, something like Business Professionals of America, when you go to a conference, you have to wear a suit. You have to wear business attire. If you don't, it will cloud your participation. Um, I have judged myself debate meets. Those kids all come in in professional wear. If you can't afford a jacket or a suit, we don't want to exclude those children from participating. It's kind of, it's kind of the uniform, so to speak, for that club. So if it's mandatory for participation um, and we don't issue it from the school, then we wanted to put it as something that would be a candidate for a potential fee reduction. Not, we do, we do a distinction between that and spirit wear that's kind of fun to have, that is optional to purchase, you know, that t-shirt or that, you know, extra, extra item that's really truly optional. Um, so that's different from sort of the, the mandatory extras, if, if, that's, if that makes any sense. The way I'm hearing is that like for a swimmer, they have to purchase a bathing suit, yes. but they don't have to purchase the Hopkinton Swim and Dive sweatshirt that the captains maybe put together. Exactly. Right. Right. And if, if a student had a financial um, restriction that wouldn't allow them to get, say, cleats or a swim cap, or I don't know what, you know, if it's required to compete but not issued by the school, then we would want that to come into the category of something that might be subsidized with financial and, assistance. And we wanted to make sure that it wasn't specifically called out to athletics, but to all or school organized right. teams and activities that may in, be involved in something that requires them to have some sort of wear, whatever that happens to be. Yeah. I love that. I, I love the inclusivity of yeah. making some of our extracurricular things accessible to kids mm -hmm. who might have difficulty. So the wording was. Yeah, so now I know. I, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't write down this the morning. It's been a long day. Um, so. All required wear other than school issued uniforms for school related activities. Yes, I think that was it. Yeah, I think that was it too. Was there any feedback on this from any community member? They wanted not. It. And um, I'm also wondering, I know Denise Hildreth works very closely. Um, did she get a chance to perhaps, you know how we said that when we disseminate, we would reach out to different people. So um, I, I don't know if you've already done that, but if not, maybe reaching out to her, particularly if she has any specific thoughts. We can. Mm -hmm. we, we, can. we have not yet. So before we bring it back for the next reading, we can certainly send it to Denise. That would be great. great. Yeah, thank you. Is everyone okay with the changes that we've proposed at least so far? So if we bring it, if we bring what we changed to Denise, we let her take I, a look. I think so. I think that okay. what you have brought forth is great. Okay. All right. And Jen, we'll can you read me that sentence one more time? 
Um, all required wear other than school issued uniforms for school related activities. Before it goes out for a second reading, the, the additional changes will be in there as well, typically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just I think it's a good thing for the community to see and to, to know that this is being brought forward. Right. Yes. Okay, so is there anything else before we move on? So the next one is meeting agenda items, and I, this I, we touched on when I did the school committee chair report a little bit of trying to look at because the it seemed like the consensus at the last meeting was trying to shave areas where we don't need to add extra time, uh, and I know that people had the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Cavanaugh ideas individually, but because of open meeting law, there was not um, an opportunity for all of us to discuss it. I didn't know if people wanted to share anything in here that you think would be helpful. Uh, one, one thing, I, for example, that I had thought of is I don't think at this day and age where our packet is available to the entire public, I need to read the agenda anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a small savings, enough, but yeah. uh, to cut some of that out to allow more of the meat of the meeting to be discussed. But, and considering an earlier time, uh, so that we're not stretching our own ability to attend to the matters at hand. Are there other things that came out of people's meetings that people would like to say? You don't have to have all the answers right now, but things that we could implement just even going forward for the next meeting. Uh, the, the question of timing um, came up, and I don't know. I'd be curious to know how, what um, you all think. I mean, I'm just looking at this agenda item, for example, was scheduled for 825. So, I'm not sure how the timings are set. I think, um, I'm assuming it's in your meeting, I think Georgette helps with that in the scheduling. So um, how relevant is it to get those timings right? I think in terms of the community, in terms of having, um, I've, I've been very concerned about staff members who come because they start their days very, very early and the onslaught of the children will come to that school and they've gotta be ready and us keeping them out makes me nervous. I feel like that's, it's hard for them to then go back and perform their job tomorrow when they've been here late here uh, for us. So I guess time is, do we want to be more accurate somehow with our timings and do we want to pace the meeting according to the agenda or pace the meeting according to the discussion? I'm not sure, do we hold true to the timings that we have or do we, but let it flow and then acknowledge that we may not get to everything. I'm not sure where people's conversations took them when they met with Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, Maybe I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things I know that we had discussed in many of the meetings was um, the idea of, you know, sort of that, that hard stop. And we all sort of agreed that the hard stop was not going to work because at some point we have to approve items by consensus, right? So there's, there's that issue of needing to be able to pay our bills. Um, two things I think did surface was the idea of creating maybe a more realistic agenda, like to, to put a number of items on there that realistically we won't get to it unless we're here until you know, 10, 15. We could probably curb that a little bit. And I think we talked about stopping putting policies on until we get through budget season. So just to kind of create that balance. Um, but I think we all struggled with the idea of being able to give an agenda item the attention it deserves and really being able to know while planning the agenda how much attention it will, re it will require because sometimes something that in the planning moment feels like that could take about 10 minutes will take us 20. And so um, one thing that I would recommend is just having someone who could sort of work as that um, sort of timekeeper position to sort of stop things and say, okay, we've been on this now for 20 minutes, we said 10, does it make sense for us to put this to the next agenda or do we feel like we're close to uh, where we would like to be and you know, either get it ready for you know, a vote or, or not a vote? Yes, uh, I personally um, 
you know, felt the same way that we need to set realistic timelines. Um, you know, every, every committee is different and I think the personalities that we have, we all share our thoughts here, right? I certainly do. I know I ask all my questions, Susan. Uh, and so I would say that um, setting realistic timelines is the number one step, mm -hmm. right? And with regard to items with consensus, I mean, if we are running too late, right, we can say that maybe this is one item we take on to the next, um, into the next meeting, but we do move forward with the items by consensus, right? But I, I don't want us to rush through something without giving it the due time that's needed. However, if after the due consideration, let's say we decided this item is going to take 20 minutes, right? But it's 25 minutes, 30 minutes, right? That's when you make a call. As you know, uh, uh, when we run the community communication meeting, we had like, I don't know, 10 people and we have an hour. And you have to, as an organizer, just say, okay, guys, you know, we need to wrap up or let's bring it back to the next meeting because we have all these other agenda items. So that's something that I think could be done. It's not easy, um, but if we do proper planning where we have given the due diligence, right? Sometimes we have only five minutes listed for some of the items. Um, and is that fair? And I would think that you would have done some assessment already. Right? But if we are consistently running late on every meeting, then obviously there is room for improvement. And I don't know if we have run every meeting late. I think last meeting was an exception when uh, Ms. Seba came and that conversation was very long as compared to the time that we had on the agenda. Right? There, I actually, we actually have run ahead of schedule and ended bef ahead of time in more cases than not. There are two exceptions to that. One is our August meeting, which went, um, as we know, very late. Uh, but it was during the day, um, which is a little different. Uh, and obviously, we ran over last week. I, I think you bring up some excellent, excellent points. And I think it's hard. Some of it is going to be hard discussions to figure out. It, what, it, but to have the discussion intentionally that we've had 30 minutes on this agenda item we allotted 20, do we want to table it until next time or do we want to, do we think we can wrap it up in a reasonable amount of time? Right, and, and I'm happy to assist you, Nancy. You know, um, I think I've not participated in any of the planning sessions, but I'm happy to help in that or even otherwise. I know you have a ton going on uh, and I know it's not easy when all these conversations are going on to say, okay guys, time up uh, and be the bad guy. Uh, but I think that might be helpful to have your voice to help plan. Uh, you bring a lot, a, a lot of different perspective than I do. We don't always agree, which is good, I think. Which is good. Um, but at the end of the day, we walk away friends, so yes. that's good. Uh, but in, I, certainly I could use help uh, in terms of looking at the time on the agenda, but also it, it looking at do we want to, sometimes I lose track in the middle of a conversation. We're way over. I would never cut the superintendent's report off, though. But for example, Why not? there are times. Sorry. There are times. Uh, there, there are some of it, but for, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I apologize. But I think it's good if we're all mindful of the time. And then, you know, I'm happy to step in and say, that, you know, we've been here for 25 minutes talking about this five minute agenda. And let's not right. stop talking about it completely. Let's just stop talking about it now. Right. <laughs> and yep. push it to next week or two weeks from now. And we can regroup and think about it a little exactly. bit more, formulate our thoughts. Exactly. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, those are exactly the things to take care of. Yeah. Yeah. I think okay. the timing has to come into the conversation. Right. We don't, it's not in the conversation at all right now, so I think we do need to yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. it's, so, it's fair in a respectful right. This only time. had a five minute time frame. <laughs> and we are done with this one. <laughs> um, with that in mind, because we have run over, I just want to highlight, um, I, we could perhaps move uh, the discussion on the newsletter to next time if people would like to push that off. That is not time sensitive. Um, Thoughts. As long as you don't find it offensive, I think that's okay. I don't want it's your work, so let's we don't want to let well, it in the end. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do My that. only question, and yes. I had to do it, is that um, it will delay 
if we push well, it off, it's going to delay another month well, or, you know, so, to launch it. So we could have a brief conversation if you want, or we could delay. All right. Well, let's go you. ahead. My other concern is the amount of time it's going to take me to get it pulled up here is a little bit different than being there. But maybe we could have a brief conversation and see if we could get some authorization to move forward with this outside of the meeting and actually launch it. Uh, can you, you, sure. pull, you can pull it up on yours. and. Yeah, we can even talk conceptually, I think, too. Okay, let's I do think that. Conceptually, then. we were thinking nobody has time to write a lot of content. We don't want to add a lot of burden. No one's going to run around taking pictures. But we do want to communicate, and we want an opportunity for the voices on the school committee to be able to talk about what they're doing. So the two main elements of the newsletter that we were talking about was every month have a regular drumbeat of um, a, like a newsletter, a, from the, a chair report, like a from the chair desk of the chair, whatever, desk of the vice chair, and then whoever among us might want to add, you two would be like a standing feature. Just write a little blurb, what's going on this month, what's on your mind, or whatever. Um, hot topics, things you're concerned about. And if we had something we wanted to add, great. If we didn't, that's fine too. But there would be a standard drumbeat of you two. And, um, oh, and Nancy pulled it up. So, and every month, once we do that, we could e email it out to listserv people would get that page, and then from there they could explore the rest of the newsletter as they wanted to. So that was sort of one piece. The second piece was the idea of sort of where are we every month, like a kind of a, a list of the places that school committee meetings we go to, because we're all busy as outside of these two meetings as well, and kind of have a calendar of coming up in November, here's where you can find us, because we kind of know they're always one-offs, but we kind of know generally the subcommittee meetings we go to. So if we're actually interested in when is that budget advisory meeting, we don't even know sometimes. So we can see where each other are. So if I know you're going to the Tech Collaborative and I had something I wanted you to bring, I could say, hey, Mina, at the Tech Collaborative, I see you're going next week. Absolutely. Here's a question. So those are the two elements. It was the once a month drumbeat of a newsletter with viewpoints, a little paragraph in your own voice, and then the calendar. Anything else would be extra. So like when Dr. Kavanaugh went to HCAM, we could put a link to that. Those are extras as we have time or if Nancy or whatever wanted to add, not required. But there would be a standard monthly drumbeat that would kind of bring people to our newsletter site on a regular basis. I have one question. Um, you know, every so often someone stops me on the street. Uh, not always the street, sometimes it's a senior center. And they share a thought or an idea, and I struggle how do I bring it back. I mean, I bring it back in terms of the questions that I ask, um, but I'm wondering um, how can we share some of the voices that we hear in the community? Would it be okay to put it out there, you know, in, in our thoughts? Like, you know, I spoke with this person and they asked this question and I reached out and this is in case you're wondering, here's the response to that. Um, I think Does that sound great, okay? I think that's a great addition. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I think that's probably all of us have different things that it's hard right? to find right. where we bring them back. You could put that in, you know, as what things that came up this month. Right. There's, you know, it's sort of it's separate from to to your point from several meetings ago, not to compete or duplicate the website in any way. This is an opportunity in your voice to say, here here's what's going on, you know. So in the interest of time, what I'm going to ask if people are comfortable with yes. is w do people feel comfortable doing sort of like what we're doing with the school committee tab of the website and moving forward with this with the ability to pull back and say, eh, I don't really like the way that works and make changes down the line. Uh, and before we go live with it to have you know, the opportunity for people to. Yeah, I like that. I'm always in favor of pilots. Okay. Let's do a pilot. So here's my one question. Yes. Who do we send things to? Who's the point person? So I had thought initially, because I don't, I don't want to put any more on Georgette, that I would be happy to hold that as a point person unless there is somebody else who feels that they, the passion to be the point person, because I'm happy to let anybody do it. But I'm also happy to hold it if nobody wants to do it this week, next week, or whatever. <laughs> Did you build that? Did I what? You built that? Amanda built that. And oh, that's awesome. She, her technological skills are way beyond mine. Uh, but she has trained me on how, and I did do a mock school committee chair report in here. Um, but, you know. Okay. Is it a WordPress? It's a Google blog. Okay. 
we could do awesome. WordPress, but they're all free. This is free yeah. and easy. So. Yeah. But you can both edit it. So if we we're say both one, of, one, of you, one of you two, if we wanted to put something on it, we send it to. Yeah. OK. All right. Move forward. Okay. We send so, to one of you. Yeah. OK. Sounds good. All right. So that um, I think we can just say by consensus we are going forward with that. I don't know yes, that we need a, we an can. official a motion. Pile it, and then can we have a target date? Next week. What? To publish? Well, to make so, it live? Well, oh, here's my question. Yeah. Um, so because it will be a regular drumbeat, do we want to do it the first of the month? Do you want to like, launch December 1, maybe, is what I think? Or do we want to do the end of the month? I mean, um, so that people can start to anticipate when to look for it. It's always nice to kind of yep. know as a consumer when you're going to get it. I like December 1. I think December 1 right, might so work. So let's do December 1 then. Yeah. So in the meantime, uh, we can pilot it, pilot it amongst ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, just to be clear, I don't have anything like a vice chair report, really. I have my school committee member report. And I think all of us would do it as a member, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, that's how I look at Leave a chair report. I think. Sure. Yeah, just want to clarify. See what happens organically for the first couple yeah. months. Yeah. And then okay. we can go back and change it. Uh, but I love your idea of bringing in thoughts from voices you've heard outside of here. Yeah, thank you. Word on the street. Word on the street. I oh. like that. <laughs> so that brings us to old business, uh, which I had, did not put on the agenda last time. So just I am looking and hoping that um, to have the uh, appointment to represent the school committee on the subcommittee for the bridge. Nancy, I move to approve you as the liaison to the bridge subcommittee. Second. Motion and a second. Um, aye. 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 Okay, so that brings us up. I have not skipped anything, correct? Uh, toward <laughs> I don't think so. Right on track. I think we're good. Our <laughs> next item for public comments, I see nobody in the public unless there's somebody um, hiding someplace. Uh, and that brings us then to items by consensus. Okay, as the superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the items by consensus as listed on your agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Jen, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. And uh, so moves. And with that, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. So, and we are adjourned at 9.41 p.m. Our next meeting is uh, November 15th, uh, at back at the uh, high school pending, uh, assuming there's no other wild uh, athletic competition happening in there. Mm. Thank you very much and have a good night.